call to order the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors hearing for March 21st, 2018. And the clerk, call the roll, please. Yes, Supervisors Frost. Here. Kennedy. Here. Natoli. Here. Cerna. Here. And Peters. Here. You have a quorum. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is Cablecast Live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel, on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Sunday, March 25th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. A DVD copy is available for checkout from any local library branch. Members of the audience wishing to address the board may sign up at the kiosk or fill out a speaker slip and hand it to staff. When the chair calls your name, please come to the podium. Also, please silence all of your electronic devices at this time. Thank you. Would everyone rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Before, before we start, uh, could I ask that everyone in the audience turn off your cell phones or put them on silent? And then uh, I think there are a lot of people here who haven't been here before, so um, uh, personal conversations, the way the room is shaped, we can hear every word. And uh, it's very difficult to hear other things going on if you're talking uh, in the audience. And um, we will have a time for our audience to speak after the staff presents their report, and then uh, the uh, applicant will have a presentation, and then we will have time for each of you who wish to speak to speak for two minutes. So be thinking about what you want to say, and hopefully it's something different than the person next to you. Uh, just want to give you that heads up, and that's how the program is going to go today. So call the first item. Item number one is the Silver Springs Lot P project. This is a community plan amendment, rezone, zoning ordinance amendment, tentative subdivision map, special development permit, and design review for a property located at the northwest corner of Excelsior Road and Calvine Road in the Vineyard community. The environmental document is a final environmental impact report. Okay. Good afternoon. Leanne Muffet. Yes, members of the board, my name is Leanne Moffitt. I'm the Sacramento County Planning Director and I am here to give the staff presentation and I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, the project before you is the Silver Springs Lot P project. Um, it is located on the northwest corner of Excelsior Road and Calvine Road in the Vineyard community. Um, there is no amendment to the general plan. The general plan designation is agricultural residential and it will remain that way. There is a requested uh, amendment to the vineyard community plan to go from AR2, two acres per unit, down to AR1 for the 91.5 acre site, and also to amend policy AR2B to allow consideration of parcels less than two acres. There's also an amendment to the Vineyard Springs comprehensive plan uh, to go from AR2 two acre minimums to AR1, one acre minimums for the 91.5 acre site, and also to amend the Vineyard Springs comprehensive plan um, to allow for 48 units on the site since there is currently a cap of 43 units in the adopted plan. There is also a rezone to go from AR2 to AR1 and to delete uh, the zoning agreement conditions 17 through 22 of the 1991 zoning agreement. There is a requested tentative subdivision map for 48 residential lots on 31 acres, one 50.5 acre wetland preserve, five landscape corridor lots taking up 3.4 acres, one trail corridor on 0.7 acres, and 5.9 acres of roadways. There is a special development permit to allow for, um, as uh, stated in the zoning code, clustering to provide open space resource protection uh, by transferring the right to develop uh, one acre lots on the proposed preserve lot A in the north uh, down to the south. Uh, the special development permit would also uh, allow reducing the minimum lot size from one acre down to 20,000 square feet 
It would amend the street cross sections to eliminate a requirement for sidewalks, curbs, and gutters. Uh, it would remove the requirement for a sound wall adjacent to uh, lot P, and it would potentially include a multi-use trail in lieu of a meandering sidewalk. And then you also have design review entitlement. Uh, the map on the right is the full lot P uh, site, and it's the full project area, um, showing the clustered half-acre lots in the south and the proposed lot A that would be a permanent uh, wetlands preserve uh, in the slightly more than northern half. Um, we've also given you a blow up on the left where we've tried to zoom in a little bit on the lot sizes in case there needs to be any discussion about the lots uh, so you can see how the lot layouts work there a little bit more. Um, there has been a significant amount of history associated with this project. I probably cannot cover it all in a concise presentation. I am going to attempt to hit some of the highlights here, um, a little bit more than what's uh, on the slide. Um, in addition, the history is summarized in reports both to the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors, and there has been additional uh, correspondence and information provided, including that by the applicant um, that I believe uh, the board and is available to the public. Um, as the slide indicates, the Silver Springs project was approved in 1991, uh, but I did want to give a little bit more detail. Um, the subject property was initially the portion of a larger planned development called Country Creek Estates. That then evolved into the Silver Springs Project. Um, when the Silver Springs Project was initially submitted, um, the site was proposed as a preserve, Lot P, an EIR was prepared, and that EIR included a vernal pool preservation program. However, by the time the Silver Springs Project headed into hearings before the Planning Commission, um, the applicant requested to drop the Lot P site from the larger project. <coughs> However, the EIR had already been prepared and that would have triggered a revision to the CEQA document. Um, and as you know from experience, that results in delays and therefore um, the applicant chose not to pursue that change. County staff during that process did recommend conveyance of development rights to a public entity to uh, result in the permanent protection of Lot P. However, the applicant quite clearly uh, leading up to and through the Planning Commission and Board hearing process um, indicated their desire to attempt to seek development rights through a future discretionary entitlement process. Um, the project was ultimately approved by the Board of Supervisors in October of 1991. It was on the board calendar five times. I'm not sure they talked about it all five times. I think they talked about it at least four times. Uh, the applicant has provided a transcript of hearing number four, um, which is the one that most directly deals with the outcome of what the board did uh, with regard to lot P. Um, and as the slide says, uh, the board did make a different decision about what to do on Lot P uh, at that hearing. There was a lot of back and forth about what to do leading into the process. Um, the board discussion and outcome was to not require dedication of an in perpetuity easement or conveyance of development rights. They determined to leave the zoning at the two acre minimum AR2 zoning um, as an ag zoning had been con considered and discussed. They determined to impose a number of conditions, including condition number 19, uh, which reads, the use of lot P shall be restricted to open space and subdivision of lot P shall be prohibited. I do think the discussion before the board was a little more nuanced um, than a strict reading of the condition would imply. Um, there was definitely a discussion uh, that the applicant desired to apply uh, to potentially urbanize uh, all or a portion of Lot P. And the phrase that's used repeatedly during that hearing is that the board or a future board would maintain absolute discretion to approve or deny any future application. Um, but however, the right, right to apply was uh, allowed. Yeah, the map was approved on a four to one tentative vote. Ultimately, um, in October, it went on a four to zero vote. Uh, there was an open space management plan required. It was submitted. However, after the subsequent requested map entitlement was submitted in 1999, that open space management plan did not move forward. 
Uh, I'll talk about the federal permitting in a minute. Um, and staff signed off on the EIR mitigation monitoring and reporting program in 2009. Oh, I'm sorry if you'd pause for a moment. Yes. Mr. Cerna. Thank yes. you. <clears throat> uh, Leanne, can you go back to the previous slide? Certainly. So I just want to be clear. I understand um, sequence of, of events here because I think it's really important to, um, to all, for all of us to have the, the same understanding. Um, the, as it relates to the CEQA document, I think what I heard you say is that back in 1991, uh, the project proponent um, changed their mind. Um, that that was going to be a component part of the application. However, the EIR preparation had already commenced. Therefore, the final CEQA document, the EIR, contained that element of it. Um, but it was made clear at the time there was a hearing or hearings, whether it be at the Planning Commission or the Board, that that was not going to be uh, what the project proponent was pursuing, regardless of what's in the EIR. Is that correct? Yes. They indicated the desire to want to preserve the right to uh, seek to develop, sure. so not does, knowing what the outcome would be. So does that mean that there's any force and effect of law associated with the fact that you have a CEQA document that has that, regardless of the redirection that the applicant took at the time? Uh, that's not what I was trying to imply. Okay. I, I, I don't believe so. Well, maybe it's a question for yeah, county council. Right. I don't believe so. Okay. No. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, when the board approved Silver Springs development in 1991, they did impose a condition number 19 uh, that I read just a minute ago, um, creating an expectation by adjacent property owners that the site would not develop. Um, I do uh, also want to reemphasize that the applicant was clear in expressing their intent, intent to seek to further subdivide and that the county did not require a permanent easement be granted, nor did the county take development rights and, and did not have them conveyed to the county or another party. Um, regarding mitigation, in 1990, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers issued a Federal Clean Water Act Section 404 permit for the Silver Springs project that did not rely on Lot P for mitigation. In 1994, Lot P was identified as an avoidance area, uh, but those provisions uh, associated with the federal permitting allowed the applicant the opportunity to pursue future permits for development of Lot P in the future. And in 1994, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a revised biological opinion for the Silver Springs project using Excelsior 184 to mitigate for the Silver Springs project. Um, ten years passed between 1991 and uh, 1999, maybe nine years, uh, and a, pl a planning entitlement application uh, was submitted to the county for 82 one-acre lots, um, taking up most of Lot P. Uh, there were uh, some issues. Uh, county planning was not directly involved, but associated, uh, as we understand, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers process. Um, and we believe that project uh, did not receive a 404 permit. So after another 10 years in 2009, a revised project proposal uh, was submitted for 57 half-acre lots, um, so they uh, fairly significantly modified the project uh, to go down to 57 half-acre lots. Uh, that project was placed on hold, another five years passed, and in 2014, the application was taken off hold and then moved forward through the process. After release of the draft EIR, the project was further revised down to 48 units. Um, I believe in, in particular in order to reduce the number of uh, new backyards uh, abutting existing lots. Um, so in conclusion, the project uh, before you today is a clustered residential development of 48 homes with in perpetuity preservation of a 50.5 acre wetland area. The Vineyard Community Planning Advisory Council considered this at their hearing of August 15th, 2017. There were 64 members of the public in attendance and all but one who identified himself as a potential home builder were opposed to the project. 
Uh, there were a variety of concerns expressed. Some were technical regarding traffic, drainage, water supply, and sewer. Um, there was uh, concerns expressed that there was an expectation based on the wording of the condition uh, 19 that lot P was permanent open space and could not be subdivided. Uh, there was uh, testimony about the payment of lot premiums, um, and you do have some correspondence related to this in your packet um, from the applicant's representative uh, between JTS and AKT about those lot premiums uh, and some uh, other disclosure documents. Um, there was also testimony at the CPAC meeting uh, with concerns about layout, including that some lots, particularly those at the end of Brogan Court, would have numerous new neighbors. And ultimately, the CPAC uh, voted to recommend denial to the Board of Supervisors on a 6 to 0 vote. Um, with regard to the CEQA document, um, the draft EIR and final EIR, um, I, I do want to uh, pause here and introduce some staff. I have Tim Hawkins, who's our environmental coordinator and also has acted as the project manager, and Elizabeth Boyd with Incent, Ascent Environmental. Uh, Ascent did the CEQA documents for us and also acted as planning consultants, and they would both be available if you have any detailed questions uh, on the draft or final EIR. And then we also have Matt Darrow from Department of Transportation, if there are any questions there. Um, the CEQA document, the final EIR, concludes that there are no significant impacts that cannot be mitigated to a less than significant level with mitigation, and mitigation measures are incorporated as conditions of approval. The project was also considered by the Design Review Advisory Committee, who found the project in compliance with the countywide design guidelines. Um, planning staff made our recommendation to the Planning Commission, uh, which was for denial of the project. Uh, our reasons for recommending denial were the long-standing expectations, inten intentional or not, set by the prior project, including condition number 19, as well as an analysis that we did of community compatibility and consistency with several policies in the Community and Comprehensive Plan, including Community Plan Policy AR2, Vineyard Springs Comprehensive Plan Policies 2, 3, and 17. And those are detailed in the Planning Commission report. And we do also have an attachment 9 showing prevailing lot sizes uh, in the area, uh, the ma majority of which tend to be larger than half acre lots. The County Planning Commission, um, well, the recommendation before you is that of the County Planning Commission, which is for approval. The County Planning Commission met and considered the project on December 11th, 2017. They did express concern about the language in the 1991 resolution, including condition 19, but also stated they felt that the applicant had a right to request to develop the parcel. The Planning Commission's conclusion was that the current proposal is a good compromise as it preserves more than half of the site. It actually preserves about 55% of the site as a permanent wetland preserve. Uh, members did express some concerns regarding the interface between existing homes and new homes, and they requested the, the applicant work with the community to soften the interface between the two developments. Um, however, the project before you is substantially the same as that that the Planning Commission uh, considered. This slide goes through all the details of the actions that you would be taking in order to approve the project. Uh, this matches the front of your board report. I'm not going to read all the words on this slide. Um, I do want to add a couple of additional uh, details, however. Um, I want to point out a few of the key conditions uh, for your consideration in attachment two, uh, to the extent that you have questions or may uh, end up uh, at the end of this meet hearing having deliberations. Uh, I wanted the board to know where to find some of those conditions. So in attachment two, um, I wanted to point out particularly condition number three and four. Uh, condition, those both apply to the lots that are immediately adjacent to the adjacent neighbors. So. It applies to lots 5, 6, 7, and 25 through 34. Condition number three limits the new homes in the subdivision to single story with a 24 foot maximum height to the peak of the roof. Condition number four specifies um, that there shall be a minimum rear yard setback of 35 feet. Uh, and I want to be clear about what kind of uh, uh, improvements and structures that setback would apply to. Um, a, a, as written, that would apply to the primary home and a residential accessory structure 
uh, it, it is as written, planning staff would interpret it not to limit improvements such as accessory structures like pools, sheds, or detached garages. So I wanted to be very clear about uh, how that condition is written. Condition number seven uh, specifies uh, CCNRs. I know we don't routinely apply CCNRs, but in this case, it is written really around maintaining open space areas. Uh, so that's what that CCNR condition is about. Condition number eight um, is the one that addresses the requirement for a new preserve entitled Lot A with a deed restriction to preclude all uses except a wetland preserve and fencing. And that condition would also result in the recordation of a conservation easement, ensuring permanent protection, uh, as well as annual reporting uh, on the biology. Um, there are all the mitigation measures are incorporated into the conditions. Uh, I'm not going to go through them one on one, one by one, but I wanted to point them out in case you have any questions. And there are also DOT conditions uh, on, for transportation, which are conditions 36 through 54. And as I mentioned, we have Matt Darrow here to help us talk through uh, any of those. And uh, with that, that concludes the staff presentation. Any questions for the planning director? Yes. Um, Mr. Natoli, then Mr. Cerna. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Leanne, um, taking back to the uh, planning staff report for a moment, um, and I know you touched on it in the planning staff recommendation, which was for denial, that uh, you talked about the community compatibility. Could you just, um, I don't know if you have a copy, put that chart up that showed uh, existing land uses, zoning, community plan designations for, for the general area for a moment? Okay, give me just a minute. Okay. Oh, you want, yes, this? Yeah, I think it was, I, we, all my pages don't have numbers on, so I couldn't take it to a specific page. It was under that land use and neighborhood compatibility. Well, actually, there was a chart in the staff report. Oh, um, it follows, you had some tables there and the Vineyard Springs, Vineyard Community Plan, and then under the section in attachment 10 to our report, land use and neighborhood compatibility. This is not it that's on the screen? No. Okay. No, it's a, it's a, it's a chart that shows a surrounding zoning. Okay, if you don't have it, maybe you can pull that up later in response to um, the question. I guess my, 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 my question goes to then, in your analysis though, in planning staff's analysis of this, you looked at areas both within the um, Silver Springs development, obviously that's the areas to the west and to the, to the northwest of the proposed uh, development. You also look to the east in the unincorporated area and to the south in the city of Elk Grove. That was the point I wanted to make. So and basically found for the most part, uh, I mean, recognizing the uh, existing Silver Springs development that AR1 uh, in that development, but then found a, a um, variety of zoning, everything from AR1 to uh, AR10 in the surrounding vicinity. And that, that was, I wanted to establish the analysis for your kind of community compatibility, neighborhood compatibility, is that? Right, yes, and there is the attachment nine that sort of graphically shows that. Okay, and I was actually going just to the chart itself. I yeah. know there's a graphic sure. too that's different than what's up on the screen here, that's, that's the development itself. So, but then I guess I, I want to dive a little deeper then. So the staff analysis and in, in, in looking at though, you, you looked at compatibility both within the existing Silver Springs development, and we've heard from a lot of folks there, but we've also heard from folks though uh, along Calvine Road and to the east uh, uh, and, and, uh, and further to the west. And so your analysis though, and your conclusion was, I guess I don't want to put words in your mouth, but conclusion was that for reasons of community compatibility, neighbor compatibility, and the expectation, I'll ask about that in a moment, relative to the uh, preserved area or the open space uh, designated area, that those were the, were the points that drew you to the conclusion that you recommend for denial, is that? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and there was a little discussion in there as well that the uh, lotting pattern uh, in the Silver Springs development, uh, the, the phase that abuts with Brogan Court and some of the ones that there, there was no stub streets into um, to the uh, area that's currently designated open space lot P. Right. And so that, that, that might further reinforce, I think if I again characterize it correctly, further reinforce expectation by folks uh, who, again, I may have been told other things by the builders, not necessarily by the original developer and uh, despite what they may have said at the, uh, at the hearing in 1991, 
Um, were you able to establish that folks, because I've seen it in the correspondence, that some folks may have paid premiums, at least original owners, and I know we've heard from a couple of original uh, purchasers there, that they paid premium for lots because of the open space preserve that was adjacent to their lots? There, there is materials in your packet uh, showing a variety of things. Uh, showing uh, someone has provided a sheet showing an estimate. I don't know that I can validate that. I mean, it right. stands, it is what it is. I'll let you judge uh, sure. the validity of it yourself. Uh, I can't independently verify that. There certainly was testimony. And then there's the correspondence back and forth that's in your packet in attachment, uh, I think 15, or is it 13? Um, between JTS and AKT. Right, I saw the correspondence yeah. and it was available for everybody to view. Right. And so uh, that along, and I'm gonna go back to this community compatibility just for another moment. So, uh, because you talk about in your reclamation with denial is planning staff's denial and you know, obviously the CPAC for the reasons that, that they've cited and the commission for the reason they cited moving this forward. But you talk about the creation of half acre lots which if you take the AR1 zoning without a special development permit, it's 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 one unit to 1.6 gross acres, and they're they're proposing the development on 31 net acres. So I don't know how that would factor out, but uh, basically that um, this doesn't doesn't fit uh, from a lot size perspective. Is that accurate? We were concerned. Um, it, obviously, the zoning code does allow. Uh, applicants right. to apply for a special development for the preservation of open space. That's a discretionary permit. It is in the zoning code, so they are allowed to request that. We looked at the overall community plan policies and the prevailing lot sizes, um, and we did uh, come down on the side that we were concerned that the half acre lots, I mean, you're, first of all, you're rezoning it from two acre minimums down to one acre minimum, and then you are further clustering. And we were just not convinced that that was compatible with the community. Okay, and again, I know there's a lot of information we've received, and I, you know, but as planning director, certainly from the staff report that went to the commission, that's, again, obviously now we have the planning commission's recommendation, uh, which was, took a, you know, took a different stance than what the staff recommended. Um, one other question then about, um, you cited the conditions from the original 1991 zoning agreement and those that would be um, removed as a part of this action. And I think you said 17 through 21, is that correct? Yes. Let me okay. find those notes. Yes. So <laughs> on page 10 of the original zoning agreement, which is where references all the wetlands on a project site shall be preserved, and, and actually reference, I guess, the 5.4 acres that were part of the um, developments before the board at that time in 1991. Yep. So that, that, that goes away altogether? Yes. Okay. And then um, condition 18, which is the lot P, the vernal, is cited here as a vernal pool preserve, should incorporate a 20 foot wide buffer within its boundaries talks about that, so that goes away entirely? Yes. Okay, in 19, obviously you referenced this specifically, the use of lot P shall be restricted to open space and subdivision of lot P shall be prohibited. Yes. And then 20, no grading activities whatsoever since they're asking for a development permit, so that goes away. Yes. And then 21, provide for perimeter fencing for the proposed golf course, which was obviously was built um, while Hawk exists, so that goes away too? Yes. Okay, so those are the ones. Other than that, though, there are no other conditions. I mean, those are significant, substantial, but those are the ones that would be totally excised from uh, what's before us here today. Yes. Okay. One last question then, just about on the staff report. Um, the, you just mentioned in the staff report on the 404 permit that one hasn't been obtained yet that staff does believe, and obviously the applicant will, will speak to this as well, that they can obtain it for the portion that they're proposing to develop. And does staff's analysis take a much deeper dive on that, or you can leave that to a, 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 assuming that uh, something were to be approved here, that, that they have to go off and get that. Uh, it doesn't right. tie back to the board's action. So they, it's not a prerequisite to have that before they come to the board then? It is not. Okay, all right, that's all I have right now. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, you mentioned that the, um, there's been some interest expressed, I guess, by the Planning Commission, perhaps also by the CPAC, but I think you mentioned <laughs> mostly by the Planning Commission that the applicant work with uh, <coughs> Silver Springs community to soften yes. um, the possible interface between the 48, or I guess the, uh, maybe it's the entire 48 lots, but most um, critically the 11 or 10 lots that I guess would join directly. Do you know what to what extent that those conversations have been had thus far? 
I do not know the whether or not the invitation has been made to to discuss those um, means to, to soften the the interface or the impacts. I don't know specifically. <laughs> yeah, and I the project hasn't been revised, and there haven't been any additional conditions okay. as a result of that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board before we go to the applicant? Thank you. The applicant will come forward. <coughs> Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Nick Avdis with the Thomas Law Group on behalf of AKT Development and the Silver Springs Lot P project. Uh, with me here today is um, uh, Matt Spokely and Stan Meddy from Wood Rogers, our civil engineer and our, uh, our planner for this project, as well as uh, Mr. Angelo Christie, a representative from AKT. At the outset, I wanted to address the comment that you made, uh, Supervisor Cerner, related to outreach uh, subsequent to the Planning Commission hearing. Uh, we did reach out to the uh, Silver Springs HOA. I spoke to Mr. Brian Rucker on several occasions, and he had indicated to me that he extended invitations to folks that um, have properties that immediately adjoin Lot P uh, to meet with us to discuss uh, potential issues and, and to just talk through those. Uh, nobody uh, uh, took us up on, on that offer, and I think he provided an email to that effect. I was subsequently also uh, uh, contacted by uh, Mr. Bart Baer, a member of the CPAC. Uh, we met and uh, talked on the phone uh, several occasions uh, discussing uh, a list of issues, uh, areas of potential compromise. Uh, unfortunately, we would not come to uh, an agreement on, on those issues. We feel that in terms of softening the transition from the existing Silver Springs community, to the Lot P project uh, is sufficient, and we'll go into that detail here in our in our presentation. So with that, I'd say certainly that this project, with hindsight being what it is, I think both the county and the um, applicant, the property owner, would have done things differently some 27 uh, years ago. Um, but I'm sure the pub members of the public would agree with that, and certainly the can was kicked then, and uh, here we are. And we have a piece of property that really is not a state of limbo. It's neither a preserve uh, nor developable as it sits. So we do have a bit of a presentation. I'm going to split it up into two parts. Um, Stan Meddy from Wood Rogers will go through the vision and the design of the project. And after he's uh, done, I will go through um, a brief history of, of Lot P and uh, what has happened over the last three decades. Um, you know, in terms of the project itself, it's pretty straightforward, large lot, executive style housing project that's uh, consistent with the uh, goals um, of the county's general plan uh, was found consistent with the uh, county's design guidelines by the DRAC. And uh, the Planning Commission determined that, in fact, it was consistent with the nature and character of the surrounding community. But with that, I'll let uh, Mr. Meddy uh, go through those details, and I'll be back shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a PowerPoint. If we could put that up on the screen, please. Could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Stan Meddy with Wood Rogers here on behalf of AKT. Appreciate the opportunity to address you today on this project. We do have a PowerPoint presentation. Let's get acclimated here. Make sure I'm clicking this. Here we go. So my job today is to tell you about the design of the project. It's, we're, we're very proud of the way this project laid out. Irrespective of the history, this project does take advantage of several general plan policies, and I'm going to walk through those policies toward the end of the presentation. But I'm going to start with the design aspects. Start first of all with the open space. 50-acre wetland preserve, permanent conservation easement will be placed over, the, over it. There will be a regional trail corridor crossing the north end of the property, then will connect to the Laguna Creek Trail that exists further west of the site. This represents 55% of the total property, and it, the open space corridor will be permitted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It will provide preservation enhancement of the vernal pools and other, other seasonal wetland features, providing permanent oversight management, monitoring, and maintenance. So I want to talk about enhancements to the property for a moment. These enhancements will include removal and control of invasive species such as eucalyptus, cleanup of debris from neighboring developments, adding protective fencing to restrict and discourage trespassing, and establishment of annual on-site grading practices. These proposed enhancements would be conducted in close coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Regional Water Quality Control Board, part of required permitting for the sections 404 and 401 of the Clean Water Act. 
I want to talk about the regional trails. We're very proud of the trail connections that will provide pedestrian safety within our project. And the first I've talked about already across the north end of the site, but there are two other features within the project that connect to this regional trail facility. One is your typical sidewalk within a 25-foot landscape corridor adjacent to the development. This will screen sound from the, the roadway to the development, but also provide a safe pedestrian route of travel adjacent to the development. Then between the development itself and the regional trail corridor I described earlier, there will be a six-foot concrete trail connection, further enhancing pedestrian safety. These are amenities that will benefit the entire community of Silver Springs, not just the, the project we're proposing today. So I want to talk for a moment about the neighborhood. These are 48 estate size lots. I know there are different definitions of estate size. Our minimum square footage is 20,000 square feet. 60% of these lots are greater than a half an acre in size. We, we believe these lots are compatible. The home sites from the street will look very similar to what's adjacent in Silver Springs. The question of compatibility in our mind is subjective, but I, I'll point out further on down the road, your general plan states that these zones are compatible with one another. Um, These are rural lot sizes. Uh, could you pause for a moment, please, Certainly. Mr. Cerna? Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry to interrupt the presentation. So we're looking at a at a image of a, the front of a house there. That's an, obviously an example. But is it the intent that the front yard setbacks would be treated similarly to the rest of um, the community to the west? Yes. Okay. So if if this were to be approved and we were to drive down. Um, this one, whatever this street is here, or streets in the in the uh, adjacent to the 48 lots, and then drive down Silver Springs proper, we should really not see a difference in terms of the distance of the of the homes to the to the. Street. Correct. They would look very similar. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So 60% of these lots, well, 20,000 square foot is the minimum standard. 60% of our lots are over a half an acre in size. Less than 24% of, of our lots, that's 11 lots total, touch fences with the neighboring site. And one of the things I'll point out later are the changes we've made to the project. That is one of the changes we made in response to community comments. And three of the 11 lots that I described are greater than 3 quarters of an acre in size. So we have a range of lot sizes within this project. The intent is to match the intent and feel. The intent is to match the feel in, of the existing neighborhood. We're talking to roadside, rural streetscapes characterized by roadside ditches, no sidewalks, executive style housing. These are three and four thousand square foot homes. These are large homes. I want to talk about infrastructure. The project is located within the urban services boundary. It, we will dedicate right away for future expansion of Calvine and Excelsior roads. However, I want to point out that we will not be constructing any improvements to those roadways because it's not in. The intent, the, it, under the current general plan horizon, it's not uh, thought that, that ro those roadways will be improved within this general plan's horizon. So those roadways will remain the same. So this is a chart from your general plan, and we didn't make this up. The general plan says that ag residential and RD1 and RD2 zones are compatible with one another. <laughs> so right off the bat, we'll just point this out that irrespective of expectations, the document points out what are compatible. So I want to talk real quickly about eight general plan policies. The staff report makes note of some policies. We have a difference of opinion on some of these. I'm going to quickly click through these. So OS1, actively plan to protect as open space areas of natural resource value, which may include but are not limited to wetland preserves, riparian corridors, woodlands, and floodplains associated with riparian drainages. Lot P will preserve 8.31 acres of wetland features within a 50-acre preserve protected by permanent conservation easement owned and maintained by a third party into perpetuity. We believe we're consistent with OS1. OS4, open space acquisition shall be directed to lands identified on the open space vision diagram and associated component maps. Lot P is not in identified on the open space vision diagram. It's not there. So we're consistent with OS4. OS 13, permanent development clustering in urban areas where grouping of units at a higher density would facilitate on-site protection of wetlands, steep slopes, urban stream corridors, scenic areas, and other appropriate natural features as open space. Lot P has available in infrastructure, will ensure appropriate on-site resource protection consistent with, with other general plan policies, including policies pertaining to floodplain or natural preserves, and the architecture of scale of development will be appropriate for the area. We believe we're consistent with that policy as well. LU4, the county shall give priority to residential 
development on vacant or underutilized sites within existing urban areas, we are within the urban services boundary, that have infrastructure capa capability, or excuse me, capacity available. Lot P is within the urban services boundary. We've identified uh, infrastructure within the adjacent roadways we can connect to. We are consistent with LU4. LU10, consider private amendment applications that seek to increase densities within planned communities, including in pending and approved specific plan areas, like the Vineyard Springs Comprehensive Plan, when the project area is appropriately, appropriately designed and sited. Lot P would construct 48 units, an increase of only five units over the original Vineyard Springs allocation. We believe this project is appropriate design and sited as executive suites, executive sites of similar characteristics to existing Silver Springs. We're rural, no sidewalks, we are compatible. LU60, the county supports development proposals that divide vacant and developed ARA1 and ARA2 zone parcels inside the urban services boundary to their maximum zoning density. The Lot P project would rezone the project site from AR2 to AR1 and using clustering per the general plan, maximize the zoning density. Lot P would construct 46 lots with ten, two additional lots reserved for a drainage detention basin, an increase of only three units over the Vineyard Springs Comprehensive Plan. We believe we are consistent with LU60. LU61, the county supports rezoning of lands within existing agricultural residential areas inside the urban, urban services boundary to create additional AR, AR1, and A2 zoned land uses when it is consistent with plans to provide for urban uses. Lot P would rezone the project site from AR2 to AR1 and using clustering maximize the density and I won't belabor the last point. We've gone through that. So LU102, ensure the, that the structural design, aesthetics, and site layout of new developments is compatible and interconnected with existing development. Lot P is conditioned for one-story homes adjacent to the existing neighborhood with a enhanced rear yard setbacks. We'll provide additional executive style housing on larger lots for the community and we'll provide additional pedestrian connectivity for current and future residents, preserving the existing character of the Silver Springs neighborhood. We are consistent with LU-102. And lastly, I'm going to, before I hand it back over to Nick, I want to walk through the revisions we've made in response to staff and community comments. We reduced the overall number of lots by 22%. We've taken 13 lots out of the plan. Uh, we've reduced the number of lots that back onto one another, onto the adjacent community by seven, from 18 down to 11. We've realigned lots no, numbers 25 through 34 to connect with adjacent parcel boundaries where feasible. We've placed a single story restriction and increased, 35, re, increased the rear yard setback to 35 feet on lots adjacent to the existing neighborhood. We've added bike, pedestrian, and equestrian trails across the top of the, of the preserve and added a six foot concrete path connecting our neighborhood to the Laguna Creek Trail corridor. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nick. Be glad to answer questions at the end of our presentation. Thank you, Stan. Um, now that we've gone over our proposal, I want to go a little bit over the history of this project. I did submit a letter, a letter that does provide some additional detail. I've been working on this project for a number of years. Um, and over that time, the questions that have been raised by community members are, are consistent and can generally be characterized as um, what's on the PowerPoint at this point. And quite frankly, these are legitimate questions that deserve an answer. So I'd say the first question is, was Lot P always intended development or was it required to be a preserve forever? I think uh, staff has gone over it. I don't want to belabor this point. AKT Development has always intended to develop the site as evidenced in the video and the, and the transcript from the 1991 hearing discussing the zoning conditions. Um, I won't belabor those points. Um, I would say one thing to, do, to highlight is, um, and it's something that we, we do all agree with, is that um, what's commonly understood to be a wetland preserve, and that is the characteristics that uh, accompany what a wetland preserve, uh, are not present here. And I just want to underscore the underlying zoning and the dwelling units allocated to the Lot P site in the Vineyard Springs Comprehensive Plan were never removed. No grant of development or rights was required by the county. There was never a specific prohibition that was adopted that would prevent an application for development, in fact, quite the contrary. Uh, the property was not conveyed to an independent third party for purposes of enhancement and ongoing operation and maintenance as a preserve. There isn't a conservation easement, and there isn't a funding mechanism to enhance or maintain uh, biological resource values. 
The second question um, is, did existing residents within the existing Silver Springs uh, development have a reasonable expectation that Lot P would remain open space forever? I mean, we can all um, uh, disagree on that, but I, I think the record is pretty clear that the, um, that the uh, Silver Springs project itself was obviously built out by entities other than AKT development, the owner of Lot P. Um, in addition to having a, an active application in the late 1990s before any homes were sold in the Silver Springs uh, su uh, subdivision, Lot P, uh, there was an active proposal application with the county to subdivide into one acre lots. And that application was with the county for a good decade. Um, uh, there have been some unfortunate circumstances that AKT was made aware of in uh, the middle of 2000, 2000 uh, related to representations that were being made by JTS Homes to prospective buyers about the future status of Lot P. Again, uh, I've, the attachments are in your staff report. I'm not going to read them unless you want me to, but it's pretty clear that, in, in fact, there was uh, there were salespeople that were representing uh, two prospective buyers in Silver Springs at Lot P would remain preserved in perpetuity. There was a commitment by JTS through its owner at the time, Mr. Jack Swaggart, um, to require disclosures uh, from future buyers um, and an agreement that there would be an offer uh, to refund purchase price any excess that was paid in terms of a premium for living next to the open space. And I understand some people just have some disagreements with that. We've done a title search and I will say that in terms of adjacent property owners in current Silver Springs, there are 18 original residents, the earliest of which moved in uh, September of 2000, or at least purchased the house. That was um, at least a, a couple of months after uh, communications with AKT and JTS. Moving on to the third question, uh, will AKT seek development of the northern portion of Lot P uh, into the future? Um, certainly I've, I've heard it loud and clear from folks that uh, this has been a bait and switch. Uh, I certainly don't agree with that criticism. Uh, obviously, as presented by staff and the, the facts and the record show, there's it's a lot more nuanced than uh, the oversimplification of a bait and squi switch. But it does have a, a valid point, or does raise a valid point. You know, how in fact do we know that if this development were to move forward, that the preserve would in fact stay a preserve? Um, as, uh, as Ms. Moffitt alluded to, a conservation easement would be required before a shovel of dirt is turned on the developable portion uh, of Lot P. Under California law, a conservation easement must be uh, perpetual in, in duration. So that once it's uh, in place, the preserved portion of Lot P would be protected from additional development forever. So just to sort of begin to bring things home here, um, again, hindsight being what it is, I think we would have all done things differently uh, with regards to the, the wording in the, in the uh, zoning agreement. Um, that is what it is. It is unfortunate. Um, certainly, it has to be interpreted in light of which, in which those uh, conditions were imposed. In fact, those conditions were imposed by AKT at that time with the understanding that they meant that a development application would be forthcoming. Um, but we have now a property that, in fact, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, is neither a preserve uh, nor is it truly developable at this, at this point. I think approval of the current project um, provides the desperately needed certainty regarding the ultimate uses on Lot P and ensures that a majority of the natural wetland features on the site are protected and truly preserved, as well as providing for needed executive housing in the county. Um, and also providing significant bike, pedestrian, and trail connectivity for the vineyard community. I think ultimately these homes are going to be very nice homes and they're going to be in a very nice place. I would urge you to write the last chapter in this book, this long book, and not to kick the can down the road again on what ultimately occurs on the site. I think the irony of sorts in the proposal that is before you is that you will actually do what was potential, you know, as, uh, allegedly by some folks intended from the beginning, which was to create a preserve in perpetuity. In fact, there is an over 50 acre preserve that will be created, endowed, and perpetually maintained. And uh, minimal impact to um, adjacent property owners along Brogan Court and south on Polo Cross. I think I, if I were to come up with an exhibit that sort of embodies uh, the question before you, I think, on the left. I think, obviously, uh, the future of this property is in, certainly in question. It is currently vacant. If we, if we get it approved, um, there will be a minimal impact 
to the adjacent community. There will be significant buffers uh, that allow for the transition from one acre lots to the smallest lots in our subdivision, which are approximately 20,000 feet and an extensive trail um, connections. With that, thank you for your time and your patience. Okay, uh, Mr. Cerna has a question. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I want to make sure I kind of uh, distill in my mind the right way to kind of consider this proposal. It seems to me that if in fact there really hasn't been an instrument that has been exercised by the county, its governing board, the Board of Supervisors, that formally acknowledges, approves um, the protection of Lot P as open space, the action that we're being asked to consider today in part um, would, in fact, if, again, if we were to vote in the affirmative, would, in fact, be the, the moment, if you will, where we would essentially be protecting in perpetuity the same or a good portion of this of the the acreage that the residents uh, regardless of why they expected it uh, that it would be left in perpetuity today would mark the first day that there's been some solid action to actually do that is that correct yeah that is correct and just so and this maybe goes back to what supervisor Natoli mentioned in his opening remarks we have worked very closely with the service and the core on determining this boundary line between the developable portion and the preserved portion and so we feel confident that this is ultimately what will be permitted through the 404 process in addition to that, through the 404 process, there will be conditions on our project, and the conditions will be what you just mentioned, Supervisor Cerna. In addition to a significant endowment, we currently estimate seven figures that will be used by an organization, just as an example, Sac Valley Conservancy or something like somebody like that, who would who would operate and maintain uh, the preserve as a preserve. So it doesn't sound like it's it's really debatable that there is isn't a. Uh, an actual uh, protective um, instrument affecting the, this this area to keep it as open space um, in perpetuity today as it stands. What are some of the, and I guess I'm looking at Leanne on this one, what are some of the, the prospective uses that the acreage could be put to if the board chooses not to approve what's in front of us today? In other words, this, if this is being presented in part as a real opportunity to preserve, finally preserve open space, a good portion of the property in open space, and it's not affirmed, what could possibly be in front of us for consideration in the future in terms of its community plan designation, its general plan designation, its zoning? Uh, what, what is that short list, of, or maybe it's a long list of uses? Well, what's protecting it right now is the board's condition. Uh, that it be open, open space and not be further pre preserved. It is true uh, there is no endowment or other mechanism for its long-term maintenance, and that is certainly uh, a problem. Um, it's, uh, we never move forward because the application um, was made. We, there was supposed to be a uh, open space management plan required of the prior project, um, and that's never moved forward because of this application. But the original project was for an, for the applicant to prepare an open space management uh, plan. And I appreciate it. I'm not I'm not terribly interested in the you know what was supposed to be. I'm interested in what could possibly be given where we where we stand today. For instance, could you have I don't know. Could you have a turkey farm? Could you? What, what are the things that are permitted under its current its current zoning? Well, it's it's AR two, and it has to be open space. So, um, yeah, I guess you actually uh, possibly could. Uh, I haven't evaluated that thoroughly, but you probably could do some uses on the open space, recreation or otherwise. Yeah. And that could those uses could occur on the totality of the acres, not just on the bottom fourth of, of the acreage? Yes, minus the federal permitting, okay. uh, which I'm not sure whether you could uh, do certain like recreational activities without a federal permit. I have not evaluated that. Okay, thank you. Can I, try, can I say that we've looked into this and certainly intensive agricultural operations are completely consistent with the current status of that project. We could you know, graze animals, we could you know, uh, grow dry crops without the need for a, a permit, so. 
right, thank you. Mr. Antoli? Yeah, just yeah. maybe on that last point, what it, but you would be restricted on um, deep ripping, however, though. So Correct. Go, so again, you can do normal agricultural practices and, and plow and, and, uh, and disc, but you couldn't, unless you had a permit to allow it to go through the wetlands, I guess, so there's ways to avoid uh, certain farming practices, but separation from, from the wetland features. Again, I'm not an expert in that, but I wanted to ask a question, certainly of Leanne, and certainly give you a chance, Nick, if you wanted to respond, but um, absent the uh, condition, which was agreed to by the, all parties at the time, recognizing that I think planning department has uh, you know, validated, validated and I think certainly applicant has uh, uh, put forth the, the uh, reasons and why they could seek to develop a lot. I think the question is still before us, and I may go to some of what Supervisor Cerna was asking about, is whether the question is, is before us, is whether it should develop in something else. But if, absent the, the prohibition on, uh, with the open space uh, um, designation, at least in the zoning agreement, then with the A2, AR2 zoning, what is the, uh, uh, assuming the 31 acres is, is, the, is, the, is the right number that could be permitted, what is the maximum number of units using the AR2 zoning uh, that if the applicant were before asking us before, it would be before us, how many lots could they get out of that? Uh, it would be two acre minimums. I have not done the specific math. Um, could you use your microphone? Uh, it would be a two acre minimum. Um, I haven't done the math, but it would be generally 31 acres divided by two. Okay. Uh, we do use a gross acres. I'm not sure if you could eke out another unit in there without sort of laying it out and looking at it, but uh, it would generally be, be around 15, 16 units. Okay. And that would be the, be the, the maximum allowable. That's the zoning that's on the property right now, but it obviously the prohibition uh, relative to subdivision and the open space designation um, as prescribed in the um, zoning agreement prohibits that so uh, but that would not require a rezoning it would require obviously an entitlement uh, in the event that they and they would still have to be before this body asking to undo a condition that was agreed to by all parties recognizing they preserve their right to be before us just as they are here today and I've argued that obviously uh, for many many years going back to some of the early days of the actual um, uh, previous approval so it would be no more than probably 18 lots? Yeah, because sometimes you can go slightly smaller with the gross zoning, so yeah, it might be 15, 16, 17, 18 lots, something like so, that. So the, the bump here is three times as much under the current zoning. Uh, again, I, the prohibition applies to all the property, but it, basically the, the, the lot number that's being requested here is three times what, what the current zoning would provide for, roughly. Uh, yes, they are asking, as we said before, uh, to use the special development permit right. to permit cluster. I understand the instrument, yeah. and that's Plus not inappropriate. The they, they can ask for that, but they I just, yeah, again, yeah. I, cause I, one thing that has drawn my attention, and again, I appreciated, I did have a chance to look at the uh, hearing number four that was referenced here, and, and appreciated that Mr. Avis starting to call it to my attention, and, and uh, transcript that was provided. And I think it was, you know, again, watching that, obviously, the, um, Certainly, the, the statements that were made about you know coming forward with a potential future application, but it, again, back to the point about may make the application, but the the entitlements that are requested are totally within discretion of this board uh, to determine. In fact, that was said by Mr. Angelides at that very dais that you know it is the absolute discretion of the board. Uh, maybe Mr. Taren made the same reference, uh, and I will make the same one too. Yeah, yeah. it is your discretion, right? right. And, and and again, I think that that's you know the discussion here today. And again, you're not arguing that, but I just think that, that you know we fast forward 26 years, and and uh, and here we are, and uh, and I guess the, you know the the, the primary. Um, Focus point here, though, is that you know that condition that's that's on there, and you know what that means, and that's you know that is the key to all the other amendments and entitlements. Because as long as that is in place, then people can argue about what ought to be done and who might do what in future. But that condition, basically, I think to your point, uh, requires the open space and whatever condition that is be preserved um, until until it is or is or or is not ever changed. So, okay, thanks. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Any other questions? Anything further from staff? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this is a time for public comment. 
Uh, again, there's a two minute limit. You'll see it on the screens up here so you know how much time you have left. And um, we will start with Dennis Davis. First, I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to say a few words. I didn't expect to be the first one. But, uh, <laughs> you must have gotten here earliest. <laughs> my name is Dennis Davis, and I reside on Reliance Court inside Silver Springs. I've been involved in the opposition to this project since the first CPAC meeting on uh, October 7th, 2014. It's unfortunate that it was at least a rainy day and Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. because the previous meetings, a lot more residents at the CPAC, 7 p.m. in the evening, were able to voice their concerns. Uh, what I'd like to state is, I'll keep it very brief, I've been with this issue a long time, and when you peel away the layers and get down to the core, what I feel is the core of the issue, the decision in front of you tonight is whether or not you support the residents of the area in the pursuit of their happiness regarding what they attempted to purchase when they moved into that area versus the profit of a development company or an already wealthy family. Uh, there's hundreds of people out there that felt regardless of whether the, what the legalities speak to, that felt they were purchasing a quality of life. And that's the reason I'm here tonight, is to try to retain and protect that quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Heather Davis. Hello, thank you for allowing me to be here and to speak. If you would stand between the microphones, then we get a better sound. Thank you. My name is Heather Davis. I have also been involved in the opposition to this project since 2014, and I'm simply here to ask that you oppose this project. Thank you. Yeah, very succinct. Thank you. Brett Bear. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Bart Bear, and I'm a resident of the South County and here speaking and representing two groups. Um, first, I'm the vice chair of the Vineyard CPAC, and we heard this latest proposal a year ago and had a six, no, six zero vote to propose development because of its incompatibility. I have the CPAC's full support of speaking to you today as well as I'm representing a majority full voice for the greater Silver Springs community. These people are my community. I would ask uh, humbly that uh, there are some people on this list that are going to give their time to me and I would like to have a few more minutes to speak if I may. Um, thank you. I was born in Sacramento, grew up in Fair Brett, Oaks. And, Brett, and it's Bart. Bart, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, that, that is not our policy here. I, I will know. give you a little bit extra time, but we don't give time back and I, forth. I We're not it. the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. Um, anyways, the, the area um, out there has been rural, and, and in 1987, when I moved there, it was all two acre lot minimums. Um, come before you with a uniquely uh, of historical perspective of having been part of a steering committee that was formed when the original Silver Springs project was, was, came before us in 1990. This was almost 30 years ago. A developer named Angela Scopolis presented a thousand acre subdivision in rural South County, not received well, not because uh, there wasn't an expectation of growth in Sacramento, but over the concerns that we have today of traffic, road improvements with no road improvements, groundwater drawdown, loss of habitat, and open space. This steering committee brought forth the concerns of the community. Remember, there were no CPACs at the time. And after many meetings and much, much participation and discussion, the resolution that we've talked about was formed that prohibited the use of Lot P, and, it, and it, or, or prohibited it to be developed. Um, this process of mitigation is similar today throughout the county, except for big difference. Now we have nonprofits to accept this, which we would have done back in that time if we had that available to us. As you know, the planning staff required, uh, um, they require or, or requested that Lot P be transferred, and for some reason the board 
we can speculate as to why they didn't do this, but they did us a great disservice and instead left the door open in the favor of the developer. Um, this community has almost for 30 years now believed that through the hard work of these people that helped steer this and the wording that seemed pretty clear um, in the resolution that Lot P would be protected. You move forward to 2000, the final phase of Silver Springs was being done, the lots were right up against the property, and JTS as well as the community believed that this was to remain open space, so much that JTS charged approximately $1.1 million in lot premiums to be close to the lot. This premium gave the buyers a continued sense that lot P was to be protected. Um, we've talked about on the maps that there is no courts going into, or no roads going into Lot P, so there was evidence there that it was not to be developed. Um, and I believe today you would still have a hard time finding somebody in Silver Springs that didn't believe that this was to be, you know, not to be uh, built on and to be open space. Sat quiet for almost 10 more years, and then the legal minds came through the conclusion that if we can convince you to change this resolution, you know, reform it, get rid of it. And if the community got tired and forgot, which they haven't, that maybe something could be built. Well, Angela Sakopoulos, we have not forgotten. You can hear us. What we'd like you to do is the right thing and put it into a preservation. You made money on the original project, deed it over to a conservancy, do the right thing. Few ideas were floated and they talked about in 2014, a grand attempt to build on the whole thing came forward. That was stopped by wetland issues and, and the community. This was the same time that you, Mr. Kennedy, became uh, a supervisor on the board. Um, and the districts were changed and now it was in your district. And this came forward under your watch. Um, this, uh, we've always had a friend in, in Mr. Natoli. He knew that area well, he knew the rural area, and he knew the history of Lot P. Now that CPACs were formed, 100 people showed up to a meeting and could not believe what was intended. Through community outcry and the Corps of Engineers, it eventually got redesigned and came back in 2017 when 65 Bart, you have 10 people. seconds if you want okay. to begin to wind up. Okay, I'm winding up. Um, so in conclusion, this really shouldn't be a tough decision. This is not an issue of satisfying a group of not-in-my-backyard people. This was an issue of saving a piece of land for open space that was already done. It's not an issue of saving it. It was already done in 1991. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Kathy, <laughs> Not next. done, but I'll leave. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> yeah, you had five and a half minutes, though. Hi, my name is Kathy, and I live in Silver Springs, and I've been there for, I think it's 15 years now, and I just wanted to say something simple. No, it, our quality of life would be affected. Um, the roads would not be fixed. They wouldn't be, it's just too crowded now, so I would just say no, and just keep it simple as that. Thank you. Debbie Buchanan. I'm one of the original owners in Silver Springs. When I moved in there, you I just was tell told, us your name on the I'm record. I'm sorry, please. Debbie Buchanan. Thank you. Um, I moved in there in 1993. We were told there would be no, JTS wouldn't be built. Uh, time goes by, and now they're going to go ahead and build again. We truly believe that this is wrong. You can look at the deeds and read what was written, and it there's very ambiguous, which was done by the county and by you know whoever was in charge at the time. Uh, the roads won't be widened. It's just really inappropriate that we were told something and then nobody follows through. And it's something in our entire country that we're tired of. We want to be able to trust in what we're told. And this is just a trust issue. We really believe that you guys should stand with us. We need you as government officials to stand with the people that voted you in. Thank you. Thank you. Drus Drusilla Davis. And then Donna Dutton. I said, I'm uh, sorry, Doreen Dutton. I'm Drusilla Davis, and I am here because I am very much opposed to development of Lot P. I am sitting here listening to everything that's happened. I'm feeling very naive because I did believe when we moved in 
that lot P had been put aside in perpetuity. I am learning that in perpetuity probably doesn't really mean in perpetuity. I believe one of the other speakers had mentioned that it was always the plan of the developer to develop all of lot P. And now I'm hearing they're going to set aside another part of it, but I, I feel, unfortunately, that we will end up back here again in the future because it, it seems that because of a mistake early on, an honest mistake, probably nobody meant it to happen, but we have arrived here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Doreen Dutton. <coughs> Hi, my name is Doreen Dutton. I just want to say I'm opposed to lot P. I think the traffic now is really bad on Calvine, and if you take these new 48 lots, it's, it's going to be really bad. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Dutton. Hi, my name is Donna Dutton, and I am very opposed to Lot P. I know people that live there. I live very close. I'm just a few blocks from it. And the traffic is a big issue already, and it's going to be worse. And I know of these people that, that bought homes and were told that they had this open space that nobody was ever going to build there, and it was in there. They paid premium price for their lots so they could have this. And now there's, you know, I'm, I'm opposed, absolutely opposed to this. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Merle Simonson. Hello, I'm Merle Simmons Ma, and I'm here with my father, also Merle Simmons Ma. Dad is 92 years old, and he's attended these meetings for years and years and years, and remembers in perpetuity that this open space with vernal pools was going to be kept open to preserve the rural community. And it's not happening. Who dropped the ball? My brother Tim also attended these meetings. He finally moved out to Wilton to make sure he could be in a rural community, but we thought we had a rural community. And I live in Silver Springs now, and Dad still lives on Calvine Road. And these were promises that were made, and people who heard the promises are still alive and expecting them to be kept. Thank you. Thank you. Misty Daly, and then Barbara Hughes. Hi, Misty Daly. I live in Silver Springs. Um, Dennis Davis and Debbie Buchanan handed out over 800 flyers. And I can tell you from the number of RSVPs I received, if this meeting had been at 9.30 or 6 o'clock, every seat would be filled and it would be standing room only in opposition. For every reason that your own county planning department doesn't want this plan and that CPAC voted unanimously, I hope that Supervisor Kennedy will side with your constituents and that the other supervisors, too, will vote against this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Hughes and then Mike Hughes. My name is Barbara Hughes, and this Lot P development um, affects us personally, my husband and I. Our property butts right up against uh, Lot P. When we purchased our house, or the lot, in, I believe, September of 99, we moved in in 2000. I may be off with the dates, but I believe that's it. We were told there would be no building, on that uh, lot P for 99 years. We've been here for 18, and now this is what we're facing. Um, we explored 
all the lots that were available. We chose this one because of the vernal pools, because of the no building behind us. It's quiet, we love it. We have all the wildlife back there. Um, and that's, that's all part of the reason we, we picked this particular lot. And now we're faced with this. So pretty discouraged and disgusted and absolutely opposed. Thank, Thank you. you. Mike Hughes. <clears throat> And then Kim Scruggs. Uh, Mike Hughes, we live on uh, Brogan Court. Like my wife said, we've been there for 18 years. We were told that no, nothing would go on behind us. And uh, I kind of agree with one of the gentlemen here that spoke and said, well, maybe we'll put some cows out there. I'll go for that, you know? If you want to put cows, that's okay with me. Um, but you know, we were told there were fairy shrimp out there. We were told that the vernal pools were out there. It would never ever be touched. Well, at least in, in my lifetime. And uh, I just want to say, they also mentioned something about that uh, someone contacted them or they contacted somebody. I, he said something about an HOA. So I assume that's the Homeowners Association in Silver Springs. That's kind of like a voluntary homeowners association. We don't belong to it. So if he con wanted somebody to contact us, we've never been contacted. Uh, JTS or nobody has ever written us a letter saying that uh, the property was, uh, was all it was going to be uh, built on and it was never just going to be open space. So uh, if they want to talk to us now, I'm retired, I'm there 24 hours a day, they can stop by and, and, and offer something or, or whatever because we were told that uh, they wanted to throw at us some uh, landscaping and I said, well, you know, we paid $20,000 extra for our lot. You know, and then they, the comeback was, we're going to give you nothing. So that's how they look at us, that we're nothing. So I hope you people will stand together and vote no on Lot P. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Hughes, could I ask you a question? Yes. I think you and Mrs. Hughes both said someone told you that uh, the there would be open space in perpetuity. It, who told you? The young lady who sold us our house and our property. She okay. worked and for what, JTS. What year was that? That was in uh, two, 2000. Okay. And Thank we you. were told at the last meeting here, just so you know, that we were voted down three to one, that uh, uh, it was either JTS or the builder or the owner of the property sent out letters to the people who had purchased the property to let them know that, you know, if they told you this, that was not true. And so what the gentleman told you that it's not true to us because we never ever received a letter from either JTS or from the, the owner of the property, nothing. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Kim Scruggs and then Paul Bay Miller. Hi, my name is Kim Scruggs and um, I'm here to say that I'm very much opposed to uh, the Lot P uh, development. Uh, I feel like these people I've been in the neighborhood for 18 years. The people that are bordering the Lot P were told, you know, when they moved in that they uh, would never have anything built behind them. Uh, it just, it concerns me to think that any builder could say, there's nothing going to go in behind you. And there's no consequence for that. Um, it's just, it's frustrating. I feel badly for those people. Um, I feel badly for the whole neighborhood. I mean, it's just gonna have a huge impact on everybody. Um, so I just, I'd like to say that I just completely oppose this project. Thank you. Paul Baymiller. Hello, I'm Paul Baymiller, and I live on Brogan Court, and uh, my property will be gravely affected by this uh, proposal. Um, we're one of the original owners uh, in 2001. Um, we had a lot of choices. We chose Silver Springs. We were promised by the seller that this was going to be held. The property behind us would be held in perpetuity. 
as wetlands. Uh, we enjoy the wildlife and all the things that afforded with that, as well as the lifestyle. Um, we have documentation that shows a premium that we paid over $15,000. Um, I feel this is horrible if this gets voted for, and I plead you to vote against this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Fazia Kival. My name is Fazia Kevel, and um, I live right across on Excelsior, right across from Lot P. And we bought our property because we wanted to live out in the rural neighborhoods and for the open space. So I'm really strongly opposed to Lot P, and I hope I can count for your vote uh, against Lot P. Thank you. Thank you. Ami Bay Miller <coughs> and then Jerry Nolan. Hi. Hi, my name is Almi Bay Miller. We are the original owner. Uh, I think we bought the house 2001. When we bought the house, they told us they're not going to build anything behind us. We pay an extra 10 to 15,000 approximately to pay that lot. And it's going to be so sad if you start building anything behind us because you will destroy the wildlife and also you're going to create more traffics. I only work in, uh, down in, Ma in Bruceville, and only about six to seven miles. It took me uh, 30 minutes, 30 to 35 minutes because of the traffic. If you're going to put uh, 48 more houses behind us, maybe it will, it will take me an hour to get there. So I'm really opposed to Lot P. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry Nolan and Julie Mansfield. Thanks, appreciate you letting me be here and talk. This is a democracy. I have some opposing views to the majority of the people, but since it's a majority, since it's a democracy, I absolutely side with the opinion of the majority and am against the development as proposed. A counter proposal that I would like to just air out is no clustering. AR1 is there for a reason. It's been supported in planning for a reason. Clustering is just taking that whole concept and squashing it down to fit more houses into the same property. Now, I'm all for business, any business, small, medium, large. I believe in their right to make a profit, but this isn't about that. This is about changing things midstream after they've been agreed on and the attorney, I believe, said it best when he said this is a classic example of something getting kicked down the road. Please, don't be part of that. What we're looking for here is a permanent solution to a problem that has plagued us for 25 or more years. Too long. Okay, number one, no clustering. Two, maintain the one-acre plan. If this actually continues beyond today, but maintain the one acre plan and widen the roads. You know, Calvine has been, Calvine has been, we have been told that Calvine was going to be widened. It has not been widened. And soften the west boundary of this proposal so that it somewhat mirrors uh, perhaps the American River Trail. That might help the folks in Silver Springs, and it would certainly add to the desirability of that area. Long story short, not compatible, no clustering. Thank if you. If you'd hold, wait just a minute, Mr. Nolan, there are a couple people who have questions. Mr. Serna? Thank you. So yes. on the, the last point you mentioned about um, softening the, the interface with, um, with the units, whether they're AR1 units or half acre lots, mm -hmm. Um, similar to, the, I think you said, the parkway. Um, in your estimation, would that mean with specific types of landscaping possibly to, to help achieve I'm talking, that? I'm talking significant landscaping. And as a resident of the area, it's my right to say that. But as a person 
who does not live in Shingle or uh, Silver Springs and who does not butt up against it, I would think that that's their decision to make much more than mine. Thank you. you Mr. Kennedy? Uh, he answered my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's it? Uh, that, that was it. Okay. Julie Mansfield and then Carl. Good evening. My, my name is Julie Mansfield. I gave my two minutes to Bart, but unfortunately, as you said, you're not Congress, so we can't take the two minutes. I'm opposed to Lot P. I hope that you support us on this. We are not just a neighborhood. We are a community with wildlife. With We were told back in 1994 when we moved in that that lot would remain vacant. Nothing would be built on it. We took the county for its word. Somebody mentioned trust. Trust in government right now is very much compromised. I hope you all stand up and do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Carl and then Greg Stilwell. <coughs> Hi, I'm Carl Romstadt. I live in Silver Springs. I've been there for 15 years. Um, we were also told that uh, um, it's very, it's going to be very tough for somebody to build over there, and uh, it looks like it has been. But uh, you know, I heard from the developer's side reasonable expectations. You know, and I, I say to myself, what's a reasonable expectation? You know, it's a, is it the expectation of the developer or the expectations of the current Silver Springs residents? I'll bet if you look, it's going to be uh, two different expectations. As the old saying goes, it's always good till it isn't. And, uh, you know, living there for 15 years, um, I think the, resi the residents will agree with me that we've had a lot of extra additional traffic. Uh, I, I happen to still work and I have to go to 99 every day and it's, it's gone in the last 15 years. To go that six and a half miles to 99 can take you every bit of 30 minutes. It's, it's terrible. And it's sometimes very hard to even get out of the Silver Springs onto Calvine because just two lanes. And I have seen a lot more accidents recently and, and that needs truly to be, something has to be done to it. Um, you know, I guess, in, 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 okay, if Calvine needs to be widened, my question is by who and when? You know, after the development, before the development, and at whose cost? The county? Is it our cost? Is it our tax dollars? Is, uh, you know, who's, who's paying for that? Uh, you know, we'd like to know that. Um, when the developers and builders leave, who's left with a mess? It's the property owners. You know, I'm asking the uh, county board to vote no and especially to vote no in the, if, if you do have to change and say yes, we want to vote for that, to, to say no to the changes in the zoning to the developer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greg Stilwell, then David Mansfield. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Stilwell. I'm an original homeowner in Silver Springs. I live on Polo Cross. I back up to Lot P. I've attended most all of these meetings through the years. The dialogue has not really changed, but it's the first time I've had a chance to appear in front of you fine people. I think on balance, if you look at the evidence, the understanding, the belief, the trust, all these people here who or who are here today and have responded to you by telephone, if you look on balance, it's overwhelming and the decision is simple. Um, there were mistakes made in the early days, but the intent all along, I believe, was quite clear. So I'm just asking you to vote your conscience on what's right, what's fair, based on that history. And based on the, uh, the outcry of the community that have been fighting this for 20 plus years now. So I'm asking for you uh, a no vote on Lot P. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stilwell? Yes. Just, just a moment. Mr. Cerna has a question for you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, does your lot back up to the portion that would be developed or, or preserved in open space? Permanent? Preserved. But you'd still oppose it? Very much so. Okay. Thank you. David Mansfield, then Zulfikar Kival. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Hello, my name is Dave Mansfield. My wife Julie spoke for me earlier, but uh, I just wanted to uh, give my opposition to the uh, let lot be. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Zulfikar Kival, and I oppose this P on this project. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Earl Seberg, then Rod Tussing. Good 
Good afternoon. My name is Earl Seberg. I live on Polo Cross. First of all, I want to thank the board for conducting this special meeting today and allowing us to have a chance to uh, express our concerns about this project. First of all, I'm here to request that you deny the applicant uh, as it stands. Uh, the proposed project does not fit this neighborhood. Many of you have seen the mapping that is available in the EIR that shows how this project fits with the other parcels within the area. This is substantially smaller at 20,000 square foot or so half acre parcels. The other parcels are one acre or larger, many as large as five to 10 acres. Uh, it is that substantial variation. Uh, the development destroys wetlands and habitat that exists today. If you were to go out there this afternoon, you would see vertical pools in many of these areas that are gonna be destroyed by the uh, development. Uh, we do request that you enforce the 1991 conditions in the, uh, in the uh, board action then. We do have serious safety concerns, as have been mentioned, on Calvine and Excelsior. This project does nothing to improve that, except, in fact, it makes it worse by putting additional drives or street entrances onto both Calvine and Excelsior. Right now, we have very difficult problems making left and right turns onto Calvine from the current roads and we have very challenging issues with uh, left turns turning back into these subdivisions. Uh, there were premiums paid. We've seen evidence of that and testimony. You've heard that today. Uh, we encourage you to not kick the can down the road, deny this permanently today. And Supervisor Kennedy, these are your voters. They're here today to express their concern. And we appreciate the denial of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Tessing, then Jennifer Poole. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Rod Tessing. I've been a lifelong resident of Sacramento County and have lived in the Silver Springs neighborhood for approximately five years. Um, I urge you to vote no. Um, their notion is how this is protected, and I think Supervisor Natoli brought it up quite well. It's currently protected by the no subdivision and part of the agreement in 1991. The protection is already in place. It would be a betrayal of trust to subdivide this now. All the traffic concerns, people have mentioned it, I can echo it again. I urge you to follow the CPAC, to follow your own staff, to follow the members of the community in denying this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tussing. Jennifer Poole and Kathy Waldorf. <coughs> Hello, my name is Jennifer Poole. Thank you for having me. Um, we actually don't live in Shingle, Shingle Springs, Silver Springs. We live on the Elk Grove side on Excelsior. Um, my husband and I are part owners in Dome Printing, which resides here in Sacramento County, so it's not like we don't support the city. But this also affects a wider range than just that neighborhood. Where the sign says that it is um, a rural community, that was what attracted us to us. We live in the very farthest corner of Elk Grove. So when we see that there's this great vernal pools area and this um, area that just attracted us to it, it's really sad to now hear that, that that area is going to be built and all of that is gonna be taken away. We're so closely bordered to the Sacramento County line and Elk Grove that our section that we live in actually has sidewalks. The problem is, is that we already worry about using the sidewalks as it is because of the traffic. So with our eight and 11 year old trying to explain to them that that area could be houses and how much more traffic is gonna come to that area and down our street just from cutting down to Grant Line, um, I think is, is not gonna be good. So I oppose this. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Waldorf and then Michelle Canfield. Hi, I'm Kathy Waldorf, and uh, it's very appropriate that I came where I did in the order. Um, I am not a mem uh, resident of Silver Springs. We actually bought two and a half acres on Excelsior, just south of the Calvine and Excelsior intersection. We bought that in the year 2000. I have in writing that that lot P was to be a wildlife preserve in perpetuity, in writing, not by 
the developers of Silver Springs, not by anybody else, but as part of our um, documents for our uh, deed. So we didn't bring it today, but I can certainly forward that on. In 2000, my husband and I wanted to move out of the area of Elk Grove we were in because we wanted the rural nature. We remember Elk Grove from 30, 40 years ago, and we wanted to live where we had space. So we bought two and a half acre pasture, sorry, I'm a little nervous, two and a half acre pasture and built a home on it. My husband was the owner builder. We have a beautiful home, a pool, mature trees. We are right on Excelsior Road. I commute every day down Excelsior Road to and from work, and I will tell you there are accidents on Excelsior and Calvine We we see them. I hear them. Um, the traffic has gotten worse over the years. We see the we see the uh, building coming closer to us, um, and we're sad about the way the nature of Elk Grove is changing. That rural Elk Grove rural property sign is right next to our house. The sign on the other side says "Welcome to Elk Grove." Two hundred and something thousand people. Okay, but we still have a little part that feels rural, and there's a community there that we love being part of. Um, I guess I better jump to it. Um, to me, I don't know what the intent was of a developer. When I get a deed, when I buy a home, when I buy a property for my home and it says a wildlife preserve is meant to be that in perpetuity, I'm not going to go research that and see what the intent is of the owner. So I would like to ask that you uphold that. I would ask that you also look at the nature of our neighborhood, look at the way it was intended to be. Um, and my neighborhood is just as much Silver Springs as, as it is the Elk Grove part. As a matter of fact, I, I think I feel more at home with that area. Um, so just based on those things, I'm also concerned about the possible impact to our two and a half acres. We have a, we have a well, we have septic, we had horses, we don't now, we've kept bees, we don't now, but you know, like I said, I, I hate to see the nature of a change. Ms. Walter, over. Mr. Cerna has a question for you. Yes. Thank you. So I, th I think if I heard you correctly, you're one of the first or the first person that has claimed that you've been, you were issued some kind of I think it was a title or search or something, but it, it noted the nature of that. Okay, so yeah. if it's not, and you noted that it wasn't the builder and wasn't the developer, and you didn't mention the county, was it the realtor that sold you? Your not property? the realtor. I can't remember where I got the document from. Um, I was meant so to you don't pull remember, it for you don't know the author of that it, statement. It was a legal document um, as part of either the title search or on our deed. So I can I can pull that out and, and present. I'm sorry. I, I guess you probably vote today, but I had hoped to be able to present that here. But we do. Okay. We had it in writing, and it was not from a developer, from a salesperson. Um, it was a part of the search that was done on the property. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Michelle Canfield, then Ash Keval. Hi, I am Michelle Canfield, and um, I probably have seniority here because I've lived on Excelsior Road for 32 years. So when we first moved there, there were cattle across the street from us, and it was beautiful to see. And then my parents actually owned the property at the time. We were approached that a developer wanted to develop this subdivision over there. It was going to be one acre parcels. Now, I'm, I was 20 something years old, so I can't say for sure, but what I heard was that, and my parents were aware of this, is that we're going to be one acre home sites, one large animal or two small animals, and they were going to put equestrian trails in and a horse facility. And we have a horse ranch, it sounded good to us, so we, my parents didn't oppose it. And then the second phase of Silver Springs got built with the understanding that Lot P was to never be built on. That was my understanding. Now, having been there for 32 years, on and off, I moved away for a while and came back, and now I own it. Our mailbox used to be on the other side of the street, and we could safely walk across the street and get our mail. If that were the case today, I would get killed trying to get my mail. Okay, we've had animals killed on the road in our house is halfway back the 10 acres. So when, Mr. Natoli, you know my family, okay. So when we took our 10 acres and we split two acres off, we were told and nothing would be less than two acres. And my concern is that if you allow cluster homes on that corner, that the cluster homes are going to come on the other side of Excelsior too. Somehow Morrison Homes snuck in. <laughs> Morrison Homes managed to get one acre parcels on that 
lot at the corner of Dirks and Excelsior. And my understanding, again, was that was all supposed to be two-acre parcels. And somehow they got one acres in there. And I think it's because there's one-acre parcels on Dirks. You're running but, over your time. Could you sum up, please? Oh, yes. Just please, please, please do not allow cluster homes to come into our area. Thank you. Thank you. Ash Caval. Good afternoon. My name is Ash Caval, and I totally oppose to this project. Please, let's keep open space open. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gerald Pollock and then Marie Douglas. So my name is Gerald Pollock. I live in the Silver Springs neighborhood on Tobiano Drive. I'll just make a few points real quickly. <clears throat> One is it does seem amazing to me because even though we bought a resale home in 2001 there, that it was general understanding that we had that that was a property to be held in perpetuity. And then later on when this issue arose, I have to kind of wonder why more effort wasn't made on the part of the developer to dispel this myth that apparently was out there because the first draft of the Army Corps of Engineers report regarding this property indicated that it was their understanding that the property was to be held in perpetuity as a reserve. Uh, that report may have gotten modified after that, but there's some questions about why that happened. Secondly, I would point out that the intersection at Excelsior and uh, Calvine is, is extremely busy. If you ever have to go down to that, uh, those streets uh, at any time during uh, the rush hour times, you'll find that there's quite a large line and it's uh, you know, problematic to get in there. And nothing in this proposal is, is being proposed that will do anything to improve that, obviously, it would uh, greatly make that situation worse. Um, final note is, I, <laughs> listening to your own staff, look at the development and then ask the question and answer, is this consistent with the existing neighborhood? It's pretty obvious it's not. And so that, uh, in and of itself, I think, uh, speaks uh, uh, a lot as to why you know, I'm opposed to this and, and I think many of the other people here. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Douglas. And Tammy Trujillo. Hello, I'm Marie Douglas. I live on Tobiano. I uh, purchased in 1999, went before anything went up out there. When you walked into the office, there was a big uh, photo of Lot P, and we were told by the agent for JTS, Bill Hill, that it was going to be in perpetuity. I mean, truly a selling point. So I've been there for 19 years, and these last years have been a struggle. But what I see is um, the school traffic now to bypass the single lanes from Calvine, Excelsior, and Vineyard pass through uh, Silver Springs. They pass by my street. So at 8 o'clock in the morning, 2.30, I got lots of people that don't live on, on my block passing through to get out because they can't get out to those streets of, at the corner. So I can just imagine that I will have more of this traffic. My 19 stop signs don't stop this. <laughs> and um, I, I moved out there because it was, you know, country. And I thought that, you know, I had planned to remain there and enjoy this. But right now I'm, I'm not enjoying this. So even if you had to put homes, if you could put them on, a, on an acre lot, and um, that's better than squashing a whole lot of homes on a small area. Thank you very much for listening. Thank, Thank you. Me. Tammy Trujillo, then Kathleen Frawley. Good evening. I'm Tammy Trujillo. I actually sit on the CPAC. I'm a member. And I have for about 15 years. I've heard this lot P so many times through the CPAC meetings, through the board. And we've had workshops on it. And it, well, we've had workshops on the zoning for the area that it took 10 years to get that all settled out. So why we're thinking about changing that now is beyond me. Not only that, Lot P was supposed to be in perpetuity. 
and everybody's been told that. I hope that uh, we've always been opposed to the project on the CPAC. It's never been approved from us. We've always had tons of the neighbors come to every meeting that has Lot P, and it's always been a unanimous, this is not, it doesn't flow with the neighborhood, and it doesn't belong there. It was supposed to be wetlands and open space, and that's what we would like it to be. Thank I'm you. opposed. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. you. Kathleen Frawley and then Yvonne Kalber. My name is Kathleen Frawley. I live at 8235 Excelsior Road. I've been neighbors with Michelle almost three decades. I was at the original meetings. I didn't, we didn't want Silver Springs. It was zone 60 and we have farms out there. So lot P is my buffer from Silver Springs. Everyone says that we're kicking something down the road. Stop kicking it down the road. I was at those meetings. It is supposed to be in perpetuity. It's not supposed to be until people forget what we talked about. So the fact that we're even discussing putting houses down there makes me crazy. Um, if you look at the little section that's cut out of Lot P, there was a there was a coyote den. White coyotes live there. So we pushed back and forth and back and forth. We wanted Lot P to be larger, um, but they pushed the homes all the way in and they saved that little spot so that the white coyotes could still live there. I used to have a great horned owl that nested every year in my front yard. Silver Springs erased that. But we still have an abundance of wildlife in Lot P. Um, and I, I, so a couple of things. I think it's criminal that it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Most of us are working or picking children up from school. I also think um, there's, I also think two minutes is not enough. There are so many things to discuss that we haven't even touched on. Um, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to, I'm not going to tell you what I intended to tell you, I'm going to rebut some of the things that I've heard while I've been listening. Um, neighborhood compatibility, not even close. I have pigs, they smell bad. I have roosters in the morning. Um, when Silver Springs went in, um, I lost 80 chickens to coyotes because they lost their rabbits and they lost their food source. Okay. I also had anonymous notes pinned on my gate because the roosters kept people awake in the morning. If you have baby, if you, if you need baby chickens, you need daddy roosters. Um, <laughs> That's how nature works. Exactly. So if you're going to put tiny houses right up against my fence, you're asking me not only to give up my lifestyle. Oh, I shot a, I shot a skunk in the middle of the day. Because if you see a skunk on your property in the middle of the day, it needs to be shot. And there were six sheriff cars at my gate in about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I explained to them what happened and it was all fine. But just the fact that my lifestyle, Lot P was the buffer for me. Could you, could you conclude your remarks, please? No. I took the day off work. I took my son out of school. I, I appreciate and the other that, people that are for Lot P had as much time as they needed. So I would appreciate as much time as I need. No, you'll have, you have a few seconds left. OK, so I was at those meetings. Um, I am aware that you were provided the last transcript. You need all the transcripts. Um, you, need, you don't need the secret ones that happened without everybody involved. Everybody knows that was in perpetuity. Um, so, there's a lot of wildlife. It should be in perpetuity. There's no way we can handle more traffic. My son had to go to a different school because there are way too many people. Ms. Frawley, you're way over your time. Could you please give us your <coughs> final summation? How can I get this information to you? You can give it's, it's written, you can give it to our clerk and she'll pass it out to each of us. Okay, let me tell you the let me tell you the biggest reason I'm so opposed to this. It's been a topic of conversation in my family. My son's in Boy Scouts. And he said, So you mean if someone has a huge amount of money, they can do whatever they want. 
I thought America was under the rule of law. I would like to tell my son, yes, America is under the rule of law, and you can't do whatever you want just because you have money. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yvonne Calver. Okay. And then well, Clancy Frawley. I'm Yvonne Calver. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's going to be a little bit difficult to follow that one, but um, <laughs> Lot P is my backyard, and I specifically purchased my home there so that I can raise my children and they can enjoy the open space and the wildlife. And what you're hearing from many people in this room today, we don't all know each other, but we were all told the same thing at different times. When we purchased our homes, this will remain open space. I'm opposed to the development of Lot P, and I would really appreciate if you voted no. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Clancy Frawley, and then Sophia Trotter Getz. Okay, Clancy is my son, he's not available. <laughs> Two things I also wanted to say. <laughs> When it says we would have done things differently, we certainly would have. If we had known we were gonna get snowed like this, we would have done things very differently in the early 90s. Another thing, um, on the board was a map, and it said, which future do you prefer? One had question marks, one had homes. That is a bully tactic. The future that we prefer is the future that we were promised in perpetuity. Now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Sophia. And then Leo O'Halloran. Hi, I'm Sophia Trotter Getze, and I am the secretary of the Vineyard um, CPAC. And I just want to say to my neighbors, you are being way too nice. When they came to the CPAC, we got yelled at, we got attacked, we got, you guys are being way too Please calm. Please address the board, Sophia. Way too calm. Okay. Um, you should see our phone mail. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've got pages and pages. Again, I'm the secretary. I took the notes at that meeting where 64 people said, absolutely no way on lot P. And there, we've heard reason after reason after reason not to do it. And we've heard, oh, well, if you have to um, keep it um, agres to the way it is right now, what it comes down, and, and we've heard about AK, AKT's intention, I don't think any of that is important. What it comes down to is your decision. The can hasn't been kicked. No can has been kicked. It's right here. And we hear, you know, I don't know why you heard this or where you heard this. Appendix C, Resolution 911615, number 19. The use of Lot P shall be restricted to open space and subdivision of Lot P shall be prohibited. I don't hear the question mark there. I don't hear it. Where is there the question mark? Then there was the idea of, um, well, who's maintaining it? Number 21, I'm sorry, number 22. Prior to issuance of any building permit for the project, submit to the Board of Supervisors for their review and approval an open space management plan for Lot P. That tells me you have it, or you wouldn't have submitted, or you wouldn't have given the building permit for Silver Springs. So I, I don't see the questions. I, I don't even see why this is up in front of us. The answer is no, it's right here, it's in writing. If AKT is asking you to change that, then listen to us who live there, who read this, who understand the words prohibited and shall be restricted to open space, and let's follow that. That's what we're asking. We're not asking that you don't kick the can. There is no kicking of the can. It's right here. It was decided, regardless of whether or not AKT is now saying, well, that wasn't my intention. Could you please wind up your remarks? Yes. I'm guessing they have attorneys. I'm guessing those attorneys know what restricted to open space uh, subdivision lot P shall be prohibited means. 
Thank you. So even if they say they, they don't, Halloran. they do. Hi, my name is Leo O'Halloran. I didn't want to be last, but I am. <laughs> the developer wants you to rezone. Then they're going to apply a clustering rule. The general plan says AR2 and 1 are compatible. Does clustering keep it compatible? I don't think it does. Supervisor Cerna, you asked a question about the picture that was presented. A one-story house. Those one-story houses are only along the border. The rest of the houses are likely to be large two-story houses. There's not a two-story house north, south, east, or west of us. These are ranch-style homes, not two-story homes, not compatible. It's not consistent with the homes in the area. I really don't like the idea of grazing animals in the future. If you look at the, the picture, this is a locked neighborhood. There's no connectivity with the rest of the community, none. You only got streets going out to Excelsior or Calvine. Someone mentioned traffic's pretty busy at Calvine and Excelsior now. Eventually that'll probably be a traffic light. Are you gonna put another traffic light just 100 yards down the road for this community to be able to exit? Taxpayer dollars at work, I think that's a mistake. I request that the board deny this proposal. And second, I request you guys address this problem Designate the entire Lot P area as wetlands in perpetuity. Get it done. Thank you. I don't have anyone else signed up to speak. Um, so do we have staff comments? Or do you want to have the applicant speak next? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure staff has too much more to add at this point, so. Hey, Mr. Avdis, did you want to make some comments? Well, there were a lot of comments there, obviously, so I'm happy to address them as you wish. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, I thought you were taking notes and you were going to comment on them. I mean, there are quite a few comments about from DOT and a couple from planning and that sort of thing, but if you don't want to speak, you don't have to. No, Mr. Cerna would like to yeah. ask you a question, so, however. I would like you to, to address the, I think it was the third to last or second to last speaker who noted the resolution um, that was before the board back in 1991 um, in terms of the, the future condition of, of Lot P. Because it seems to me there is a, just a mass amount of uh, confusion as to who was told what by whom when about the um, the nature of Lot P and whether or not it was going to be kept in perpetuity as open space or not. And <coughs> our job, in part, is going to be to try and um, understand that as best we can to, to arrive at a decision this afternoon. So I'd like to hear a little bit about, um, about your reaction to that. So my reaction to that is that everything is more complicated than you think. At the time, the Army Corps of Engineers regulation of uh, wetlands was in a period of transition. And at that time, you could get nationwide permits um, for large projects for impacts up to 10 acres, which were pretty significant. And you could also draw the boundaries of uh, your 404 nationwide permit. And that's what Lot P represented. There was some confusion at the time about you know, whether, in fact, it could be permittable by the Corps or would not be permittable by the Corps. I mean, in the record, you see that the Corps initially did require that a conservation easement be recorded that pro prohibited development on that project. But the Corps determined later that that was inappropriate and, in fact, determined that for purposes of their regulation of wetlands, that a portion of the site was, in fact, developable. So it is unfortunate, the language that was used at the time, uh, because it could have been a lot clearer. I give you that. I, I totally empathize with these folks. I mean, the, if you look at the language of the resolution, it seems to speak for itself. However, there is a bigger story there, and it's always been the understanding that that was a placeholder, that in the future, a development would come in uh, from AKT for that property. If that requirement wasn't in there, it potentially wouldn't come to the board. If it was a tentative map, it potentially could go only to the uh, planning commission. So I think at that time, the idea was that any development proposal 
proposal would have to come back to the board. So here we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Natoli. Yeah, I, just, I have a question of staff, not so much of, of Nick. Um, so, and you referenced it when you were giving your presentation that relative to the open space manager plan. So there's no record that there was ever a submittal, any draft. So basically the, 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 the county issued all the building permits for the project uh, prior to any review, obviously any approval of an open space manager plan, which didn't call for in the language reading from the resolution, should provide, it says shall, not should, shall provide for a mechanism to fund long-term monitoring and maintenance of lot P, periodic inspections for summer runoff, and reporting fencing and buffer area details. And so there's no record of that ever having been submitted to the county. And again, that's not Mr. Adams, he wasn't even involved with the project. So would AKT or the property owners in trust never submitted that to the county? Um, we certainly didn't move forward with the management plan. Um, I, if you give me a minute, I can look back in my notes. It, I feel like I have seen that there was some submittal initially of a management plan, but when the application to develop was submitted and moved forward, um, then, there, then there was some sense that this would come before the board and a decision would be made and there was no management plan required. Ne and so there was never? Never followed through on, it wasn't recorded. Okay, but yeah. but was it was it submitted for review and approval by the by the board of supervisors? Did I don't think it ever made it to the board. No. Okay, so because again, I just and the reason I ask a question to that is that um, you know folks can certainly argue about uh, maybe what was in, intended, but if you go to number twenty two here, it says pretty clearly that there was going to be for whatever period of time. You know, one certainly can argue about the perpetuity that isn't quoted in here, but there was a requirement uh, by the, 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 the Board of Supervisors in the approval as a zoning condition uh, that wasn't, was never met. Right. I mean, there's obligation on both parties, I get it, I'm not an attorney, but, I, but, but that was never um, submitted. So, so is there any recourse, uh, is there any consequence to that? Uh, I'm gonna ask counsel that if I could. To it not being submitted? Well, or it says it didn't say submitted. Not. It says reviewed and approved an open space management plan <laughs> prior to any building permit and those lots being issued. There, those has been occupied for twenty years in some cases. No, I would say at this point there is no there is no consequence. It's something that the county perhaps should have dealt with at the time, but now it's been however many years. And so what you have before you today is your opportunity to decide right. whether you want to change things or keep things as they are. Okay. But I don't think you, there's anything that can be done about arguably non-compliance with that particular condition. Okay, but, but I guess I would just put forward, as I, I, I said a minute ago, though, that you know, for whatever reason that, that did, condition wasn't met, obviously the county issued permits and, and uh, uh, those folks, you know, folks are living in those houses and have been for a couple of decades in some cases nearly. But what this says, though, in a di to uh, 19, to condition 19, that talks about uh, the restriction for open space and the prohibition for subdivision, but then if you read down to that next, you know, the, the ensuing condition, it says that there will be a plan that will show for the management. And so I don't know, Nick, if you have anything you want to offer on it, but be clearly if that wasn't done, whatever changed with the core or whatever, but, but that was a condition. There was never an amendment that said that condition no longer applies, that you know we've got any clarification or anything around that, unless you have other information. Uh, can I provide some additional background? If you look in, I, I don't know what exhibit is in the staff report, there's a letter from August 19th, 1999, from the then environmental coordinator, Dennis Yeast, uh, to Eleni Tsikopoulos at AKT, and I'll just, go right to where the letter is. I don't, I don't have the staff okay, reports, I don't, but I'll read you and I can submit it too. Um, there was submission of a um, open space management plan for Lot P meeting that condition in, on May 19th of 1999, consistent with the conditions of approval prepared by Foothill and Associates for AKT development. Um, uh, he goes on, Mr. Yeast goes on to say, I understand the application for approval of that open space management plan will be on hold while the applicant explores options. Could you slow down just a oh. little bit so everyone can get the gist <laughs> of what you're saying? Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So it goes on to state, uh, Mr. Yeast goes on to state, I understand that the application for approval of that open space management plan to be on hold while the applicant <coughs> explores options for Lot P with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which may include development of all or a portion of the lot. 
Okay, so so that addresses at least in part the the plan that was submitted. It was, was submitted. never reviewed or approved by the board. Obviously, he has some authority as environmental coordinator at the time, but that wasn't the condition that the board put forth when they gave approval to the to the prior project. Again, not your fault, not necessarily anybody in this room's fault, but the county issued every building permit did not have that, and I don't think the authority was vested in him or anybody subsequent to that to say that that meets the condition of approval. Now, the fact is the house has been approved, but there was never an open space management plan, so the lot sat there, it was mowed once a year, as we talked about, and fences are what the fences are, and folks are, um, I think, led to believe by that particular con uh, subsequent condition that you know there was an intent behind this. Now again, you certainly, for the record, have you know uh, given what happened subsequently with the core and with the environmental coordinator. I appreciate the clarification, Nick. I just, it seems to me though that that again goes back to this expectation that you know folks, at least in some part, have read this. Uh, or a number of folks have read this. Obviously, has been very, very public in this discussion, and that seems to me to say to, to folks beyond what 19 says and how people might interpret that in perpetuity or some point in time this board maybe see another application which is before us today but there certainly was you know a much more stringent requirement that wasn't met for whatever reason and i guess it's been a, that's on hold in perpetuity that management plan because we never saw it and we won't or or well, let me ask that if we were to deny the application before us can we call out that that you know if we stay with the condition can we say there is going to be an open space management plan now submitted for consideration by this board if you deny, so then you, if you deny the the project, right? Well, you, you, you have an existing you condition. Have any mechanism to add any new conditions if you deny? No, not adding. I'm talking about the condition that zoning, should have been met. It's a condition of the original zoning agreement, right? But and we put uh, that on hold while this application was being processed. Yeah, so we have to go back and discuss where that whether that zoning condition is still in right. I don't know if not. that I, I don't know without looking at more of the file on this as to what Dennis's rationale was, what kind of, you know, what the decision making process was there, whether that has now been waived. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Mr. Cerna has a question for you. Yeah, just, just to dovetail off of what Supervisor Tully just uh, asked of County Council. Again, I'm trying to find my way here on a very complicated uh, matter. Isn't what is being proposed in large part today the initiation of just that? A, a plan for the open space, an endowment yeah. to manage it? I mean, well, and isn't it consistent with the letter that references, references uh, partial development? Well, there was an open space plan that was submitted. It's simply that staff at the time, because an application had been filed, didn't move that forward. Okay. I mean, it just seems to me we're, 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 we're at a point, finally, where we're taking, we're doing some declaratory work, finally, to resolve this matter. And I do believe that it's been mentioned way too many times today that this can has been kicked. And, you know, thank you very much, past board. Thank you very much, past staff. But we find ourselves in this very odd predicament today. But the way I understand what's being proposed today is we have an opportunity in front of us to actually approve a majority of this property so that it is endowed, it does come with the ability to manage it as permanent open space. What most of the folks here, maybe all the folks here, have been requesting. Ma Madam Chair, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to get argumentation here, but my, my, there, there is a distinction that's, that, that's a big difference though, Phil, since you raised the point, that this says the use of Lot P shall be restricted to open space and no subdivision. That shall be prohibited. So if I hear you correctly, you're saying that by virtue of what's before us, we'll get a management plan on the other remaining 50 acres under this proposal. But that's not, my point was, is that under the 88 or 90 acres, that there was supposed to be a management plan for the entirety of that. And how do you, how do I reconcile the record from our past planning? Well, he put it on hold. I'm asking that if we were to, my question to Krista was specifically, if we were to de deny the application, I mean, could we enforce the condition and say that, you know, it's, it is what it is and it's going to remain as, until this board changes it some other date, potentially, and in the meantime, we want a plan that should have been submitted and, but, and but approved. It's, but it's, it's zoned AR2. It's zoned AR2, but it can't be subdivided because of the condition 19. I know what is zoned. It, I mean, well, the, I, the, I'm looking at Dennis Yeast record. The, it, the, 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 we're, we're trying to have a discussion here. 
I mean, Dennis Eastletter says uh, that he, his recollection of specific actions were not such that I can and could interpret them as forever prohibiting development of Lot P. This is because the underlying zoning of AR2 was not removed, no grant of development rights was required, and no specific prohibition was adopted, which would prevent submission of an application for development. Right. And I agree that submission of the application is what's before us today, but, it, but right. until such time as that's changed, the zoning is what the zoning is. I acknowledge that in my comments earlier, that, but, it just, but Condition 19 is a very governing uh, condition because it says you shall be restricted to open space and the subdivision of Lot P shall be prohibited. <coughs> ART or a a a AG 20 or RD5, that's what it says. Oh. Okay. That's all the questions I have for staff, thanks. Well, um. <laughs> uh, Leanne, there were a couple of comments about <coughs> vernal pools being uh, destroyed and that sort of thing. Was that all contemplated and mitigated in the environmental work? I just wanted to address, uh, there are a couple people in the audience that mentioned that. Yeah, I mean, there obviously there has been a new uh, draft and final EIR prepared for this project. Mm -hmm. uh, there is mitigation that is required um, and they would have to move forward and still get a core permit uh, in order to mitigate those wetlands. Okay, and then uh, a couple people had questions for DOT. Um, about one who pays for roads and what the plan might be. If you could come up, Matt, to the front microphone, That'd be great. Uh, Matt Darrow with Department of Transportation, and I did take uh, notes, and I had one little thing I wanted to uh, address, and the question was about um, who would widen Calvine generally, um, and so I just wanted to address that. So, so basically, that if we are separating this project from what's on our general plan, the general plan says that Calvine will ultimately be a six-lane road in the future, and that Excelsior would ultimately be a four-lane road in the future. Uh, but at this point in time, if this application was to be approved and go forward, we're asking for Class D improvements along the frontage, which is basically we are not asking for the road to be widened at this at this point in time. We'd be asking for um, uh, frontage, shoulder improvements, drainage, and uh, uh, AC pathway along the frontage. Um, the developer would be required to pay fees into the fee um, fee district that would ultimately go towards the county in the future, making the improvements that I mentioned earlier. Um, and somebody also did mention probably the signal at Calvin Excelsior someday would be signalized, and I would agree that at some point in the future, when, when warranted, that signal would be added when? down the road. Um, when I, warranted I, is what he said. Uh, so, so that's basically trying to answer that question. And, and if, if you want me to answer that, we, we know about project priority lists in the county and how it ranks against other projects. But um, right now, ADT along Calvines in the 14,000 range and 18,000 capacity for two lane road. So while we're not worried about level of service, as people are seeing traffic increase as time and development goes on, certainly, it's still um, in a serviceable state. Okay, so. Mr. Kennedy has a question. We're having a meeting here. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy? <clears throat> Just to be clear, you, you said that the intersection itself will see improvements. You said, what was the words you said when it's warranted? What, what would? I, what I said was one of the uh, one of the commenters mentioned that probably someday that intersection will be signalized, and I was saying, yeah, probably someday that signal will be inter inter intersection will be signalized when that six by four in the future comes. That's not being contemplated with this particular development. What would trigger that? Well, what would trigger that would be uh, either development somewhere in the county causing an impact and level of service at that location, and traffic signals warrants being met, and funds accumulating in finance plans. And and don't, don't worry about funds. Let's just talk okay. about it. And, prior, and that uh, being put on the department's project priority list and 
raising to a level on that list to that a decision was made at the board that we're going to fund that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Natoli. Yeah, just on, on that point, man, because again, you know, irrespective of what's before us today, I've had conversations with the department about that, and obviously, Supervisor Kennedy and I share portions of that intersection along with the city of Elk Grove. But what you have there is a very rural intersection that doesn't even promote uh, the opportunity for right turn movements. Uh, you know, you've know, you got basically, you, you know, when you enter to the stop line, uh, um, you've got to then, you know, allow each car to, to go, you, there's no bypassing. So there are things right. that can be done at intersections. You know it well, and, and we've done them, you know, in a lot of the developing areas and certainly where pressure points occur, mm -hmm. short of a six by four intersection uh, mm -hmm. or with, with full signalization, there are things that can be done that can alleviate some of the congestion make for a safer movement. They may require acquisition of you know certain parts of right-of-way around the corners and so forth. But I guess I wouldn't want people to leave here today, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the, you, you have to go from a rural four-lane intersection with, with hard 90s to a four-by-six in order to get some relief. That there may be something intervening correct. Uh, that could be done with existing right-of-way and or with acquired right-of-way, obviously in, in coordination with the city of Elk Grove on the south leg of that of that intersection. But Yes. It's not going to just jump to a six-by-four signal. Right. You might be able to do right turn movements. If, if there was if, a, a lot of left turn movements, you could do something there. In fact, this particular uh, applicant, if they were to, to be approved, would be required to put a southbound left at that, or southbound right separated at that intersection, which our department thinks would help quite a bit at the all-way stop. Okay, but there, there can be intermediate improvements. Absolutely. And it can be either fees that are from a given project or we have a whole zone where those funds are collected. And, Correct. Know, and, I, and I think we're seeing folks divert to Excelsior. I mean, I, I was through Excelsior and Gerber the other day and, and, and in Calvine as well. All right. And, you know, during the <laughs> afternoon commute hour, and that southbound flow coming mm -hmm. that way uh, is, is significant. And 14,000 ADT on that road is, is beginning to push the limits of those intersections that, with those rural uh, constructs, sure. so. Right? Yes. Okay, thanks. So I have a question for County Council. Um, it seems to me a lot of the uh, back and forth here is about uh, the home builder not the original landowner, but the home builder giving incorrect information. And we, we saw letters from the landowner to the home builder saying, knock it off. And, um, and then the home builder responded, okay, I didn't know they were, my salespeople were doing that, I will. So wh where do we end up legally on something like that? I mean, obviously it's a not a great situation. The county is not responsible for uh, misstatements that were made um, by the representatives. Um, I mean, I suppose, you know, a lot of good it does them, but I suppose the uh, homeowners would have a right of action, arguably, against um, them. But, you know, I don't know if they do and whether that's... Uh, 20 years have gone by. Yeah, but the county is not bound by those representations, clearly. And I don't think we've seen anything, at least that I've seen, that the county, may, any county staff made any representations along those lines. If they did, it might be a different story, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. And I haven't heard anything about that today, that it was county people doing that. It seems like county staff along the way has pretty much been in the mode of we're not saying there's no ability to develop this. Yeah, I mean, obviously there was no ability to develop it unless the board takes action to do right. that. Right. Yeah, as right now, there is no ability to develop it. There and there's be. nothing that prohibits us from doing that. There is nothing that. to prohibit it legally. That's kind of what's that's that issue. maybe a better right. way of yeah. stating right. it than, than I did. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, sure. uh, uh, question, uh, for, question for Leanne. Um, there was a, a comment made, I think, by one or maybe two speakers about um, about how to address uh, some of the impacts, again, if the board moves forward with what is being requested to soften the interface between the border, I'll call them the border lots. Yes. Um, is it possible for the board to, at, again, if we're going to go in that direction, to consider some very specific landscaping requirements um, at the rear of those lots that run with the land so that regardless of what builder might eventually build, there would be a concerted effort to have, for instance, columnar evergreens or whatever, you know, leave it to the experts, uh, the arborists, the landscape architects, but um, 
you know, leave it to the people that know better how to really shield the effects of having um, a rear a rear lot. Um, certainly, uh, there is an ability for the board to add conditions if you want to move forward. Landscaping can be part of that. Um, I also pointed out uh, that the one condition, while it prohibits the primary home and a residential accessory unit, like a granny flat, from being built, it does not prohibit other improvements in that 35-foot setback. So I wanted to point that out so that you were making a deliberate decision about what you wanted those conditions to be. What, what's an example? Like like a tough shed or a utility shed? or, or? A, a detached garage, a pool, a uh, covered patio. Uh, those would all be permitted. And uh, I'm not sure what the board's intent there would be. but. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments from board members? Questions? Questions. Looking for a motion? Yeah. Well, no, I, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see your name come up. Sorry. <clears throat> so I've obviously been somewhat quiet this evening. Um, not for lack of interest, mind you. Uh, and not for lack of recognition of how important this is to the community out there. Uh, shortly after I came on the board, even before I came on the board, but after the election, I, my first meeting was with neighbors out at Silver Springs. Um, and uh, so I've been aware of this since day one, uh, pre-day one, and the issues. Uh, I quickly uh, went and did quite a bit of research. I've been entitling properties for 25 years, and I've spent more time on this now proposed 46 or 48 lots than I have on thousands and thousands of lots that I've entitled in the city of Sacramento. Um, so th this is uh, something that has been handled poorly by a number of entities over the years. Um, <clears throat> I even went down to the archives pulled the VHS tape and watched the 1991 hearing three times to really understand it and really get a feel for you know, what was the intention and what happened when to whom, by whom, uh, and the timing of when the lot sales happened to what was being said. Um, I think as uh, Ms. Scruggs said, she feels badly. Uh, for the people who are here today, I feel just as badly. Um, you know, I do think that it's unfortunate that um, whether it was malicious, uh, whether it was negligent, or just a simple mistake, which I think that that would be far too kind, uh, the people who bought those properties were highly misinformed. Um, it is clear to me from reviewing the record and I have letter after letter between the applicant and the Corps of Engineers, the applicant in the county, the applicant and so many others. Uh, I also, it was very clear, crystal clear as Mr. Natoli said, who probably is the only one with a bigger binder than mine up here, um, it, that uh, you know, even Mr. Angelitas up at that very, uh, and Mr. Taron, yep. uh, clearly said, we will be coming forward with a project. Um, you never should have been told otherwise. Um, the, the problem is, is I think county was unclear and made some mistakes, as Mr. Cerna said. Thank you, past boards and, <laughs> and, and past staff. And as Mr. Natoli said, nobody in this room. Um, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter to you, and I get that. <laughs> um, but the one point that has been clear to me is the one entity that has not been that does not put forward um, either disingenuous or erroneous information, and that's the applicant. And that's the one who actually owns the property and bought that property with every intent of developing that property. So that makes it very difficult to me, and that was the threshold question. This would have been so much easier if I watched that tape and found out, ha, AKT, you blew it. But I didn't find that anywhere. And I do believe that the applicant has the right to develop that property. Once I came to that conclusion, I, I saw it and, and, and I see the heads shaking and I, I would expect your heads to shake. Uh, but once I came to that legal threshold question, um, it, it, it became in my mind incumbent on me to make this the best project that, to be proposed to the board and then it's five votes and it's up to the board, but to put forward the best project possible. And I have to tell you, I conditioned the hell out of it with the developer. 
Uh, you know, when first when they brought lots that were not contiguous and they and had three or four lots going up against one lot at the existing lots, uh, that wasn't ex that wasn't acceptable. We moved those out, which cut down the number of lots fairly significantly. Um, you know, the 35 foot setback. Uh, other than, instead of the 25 yard rear setback was significant. Um, and I've always, it's always stuck with me that one of the arguments that I've heard is, you know, we were told that was going to be uh, open space in perpetuity. And the irony is, is that if this development is approved, it is 55 acres of, of, of open space. And um, as uh, one of the, I'm trying to find the, the person who said it, but uh, when she said, you know, oh, here you go, in perpetuity does not mean in perpetuity, apparently. It absolutely does. The problem is it was never done before. And what this proposal does is that, and not just puts it in perpetuity, but actually has a management, uh, ma management component built into it. Uh, which I think serves the entire community. Um, I uh, would like to propose a few, a couple of changes um, or con additional conditions. One change condition, one additional condition. Um, uh, and, and let me also say this, that should this be approved, I don't know, but should this be approved, I can tell you, you have my word and I know you have Mr. Natoli's commitment to work together and with the city of Elk Grove to make whatever changes we can make to make that intersection safer and as safe as we can. No. Um, I'm, that's, what, and that's if it were to go forward. Um, not putting <laughs> words in Don's mouth, but I think I know him well enough to know. Yeah, with or without the development forward, we'll work together to see that the intersection exactly. fixed. Yep. That's, all, that's what I'm saying. And, um, the the other condition I would like in the in the meantime, because I, I am concerned about the ingress egress and making that as safe and easy as possible and not holding up, is I'd like to an additional con condition, and I have this Leanne written down if you would like, but I'll read it. Uh, that an acceleration and ac acceleration and deceleration lanes shall be provided at the entries to streets one, five, and eight, subject to the approval of public works and the transportation departments, making it. Um, a lot safer and not stopping traffic nearly as much as it would otherwise. Another condition I would like to change is, and I turn the page, uh, in uh, condition number three, which reads lots five, six, and seven, and lots 25 through 34 shall be restricted to single story residences and a 24 foot maximum height measured to the peak of the roof line. Um, I would also, I'd like to propose that we change that and instead of it reading lots five, six, and seven and lots 25 to 34, I'd like to change that to lots one through seven and lots 10 through 34. Um, meaning that the entire perimeter of the property, I think that uh, would be single story buildings, which I think is more consistent uh, with the photo that the applicant showed of the properties. Um, so that would be single story around the entire perimeter. So you want to repeat the lot numbers to be sure or planning? Yes, has it is it? one through seven and 10 through 34. And let me say that I, I carefully looked at the map, but you know, the intention is all of the perimeter. Um, that's not only for so that when you're going down Calvine or you're going down Excelsior, you see something that's consistent, but also the way it was proposed, uh, if you're ex enjoying the open space, you should not, you should not have that two-story house right there that's right on the open space. I know we did it to protect the, the existing homeowners, which was well-intentioned, but I also want to protect the open space uh, as much as possible. Um, uh, the landscaping language, uh, we have enhanced landscaping to pr produce a buffer. Uh, I, I'm not sure how we do that, uh, Leanne, as far as how can we be a little more specific and put a finer point on that? Um, and I know Supervisor Cernan asked you basically the same question. I'm asking you to, it again. Hmm. Uh, perhaps one option, uh, trying to think out loud here, uh, looking at Krista too, is we could refer certain lots uh, to design review 
um, with your expressed intent uh, without trying to figure out exactly where to place things and then send those lots through uh, like a non-discretionary design review for review of screening intent, would that So that would work? do it. And so can I do that without having to pull my map out and look at the tiny little numbers I can barely read or, and just say that those, I mean. I think it's the same, yeah, you want it to apply well, the same. Those that are contiguous five, with. Five, six, and seven, and 25 through 34. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. You want Not one through seven. Is that the idea? Uh, yes. Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. We talked over each other, so let's be clear. Well, let me get my map. She, she read the lots from the original uh, number three. Right. Did you mean just those lots or one through seven and ten through 34, which was Not the Not ten through 34. Okay. Uh, it would be the original, the ones that, the ones that are adjacent to right. existing uh, just homes. To verify, five, six, seven and lots, 25 through <clears throat> 34. Yes. Okay. And so I was just trying to clarify that what you were looking for was screening. Yes. Do we need to add, put a little more meat on the bones there yes. so the design review administrator knows what he or she is looking for as far as Yes, screening? so lots 5, 6, and 7 and 25 through 34 are subject to non-discretionary design review for the purposes of uh, ensuring adequate screening landscaping um, to ensure privacy of adjacent lots within Silver Springs. What is that? I don't have that written what down. What are we screening I from? I think is what we need to... Screening between existing and proposed uh, residential lots. Right. I just think we need to make sure that we. It's still too vague for you, Council. It's a little vague. I mean, I. I, I well, vague is like what got needs... us here originally. <laughs> What's that? Vague's why we're here. Yeah, so. That's true. Let's not keep let's that lay, going. Let's, 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 let's get... be a little clearer <laughs> yeah. about what. It, yeah, and I see that Mr. Penrose is kind of not. It's, it's a little hard, I think, for someone to look at and say, I'm not quite sure what I'm approving. Well, I just want to make sure we get it all done tonight. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Do, should we write something up and then show it to you? When? If you give us about five minutes. It's fine with me. Okay, but maybe you can write, Mr. Natoli had a question. So. Well, not a question, when Mr. Kennedy's done. Um, you can sure. wait? Yeah, I can wait till Mr. Kennedy's done with his, yeah, I want to speak to the motion, I assume he's what he's doing, and I want to speak okay, to the item. Okay, so we're gonna take a five minute recess, potty break. <laughs> <laughs>